Welcome back to Kings of Columbus, Doug Maurice, Bill Landis, and we're here to rant, Landis. We have not done this in a while. I did one of these like maybe four months ago by myself. We are going to rant together. We're going to rant with our tech subscribers. It feels like a good time for people to rant. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, pent up stuff, I think, with, with our Ohio State fans, with our texters. This feels like the perfect time. So what we did is I sent a call out to our tech subscribers and said, just if you have something, to it's not questions. It's not asking for our opinion. It's sharing. And there's a lot of things here. There are people, Landis, who said, oh, this just feels good to type this out and get this off my chest. And then I do think, right, misery loves company. Like you're sitting there as an Ohio State fan. You're frustrated by the loss to Michigan. You're frustrated by the fact that the 2021 recruiting class that we did a whole show on last week did not achieve great heights on the field in terms of success. You're frustrated maybe by the starting quarterback going in the portal, by 12 Ohio State guys being in the portal, by no staff changes being announced yet. There's a lot of things you're frustrated by, and I do think sharing that and trying to figure out whether fans, other fans are thinking the same as you or not. Sometimes you want to be on an island, but sometimes you want yeah. to be in a group, right? So yeah. I think just the act of this, I hope is helpful to everybody who's listening, because I do think sometimes as a fan, you wonder yourself, am I thinking this just me or do other people think this too? Yeah, it's really, it's really helpful. Like, I, you know, I, with my teams, I find myself thinking, thinking that way sometimes. Um, but I also don't have, <laughs> I don't have an outlet like this to uh, be part of crowdsourcing to see if, if other people are feeling the same way that I do. Certainly there's Twitter, but Twitter is, it's a mess. You don't you don't know what's real, who's being a troll, who's actually being genuine with their feelings. I think the people um, who responded to this are, are giving us the real stuff. And I will say, I also sent uh, after the news of the Kyle McCord transfer, after the news conference on Sunday, when we got a chance to talk to Ryan Day, I did send out a survey to our tech subscribers, and I got some answers there that I think will be helpful. We'll sprinkle those in, and we'll start with one of those real quick. And this was a general one, Bill. How are you feeling about the 2024 season for Ohio State? These were the choices. I'm excited. There's going to be lots of new faces getting major playing time in 2024. And that's good for the program. Like, I'm not just like, oh, you know, like I'm pumped up. I'm fine. As usual, I'm assuming Ohio State will be good and competitive and they should make the playoff. Like, you're just kind of how you always are for Ohio State. Or I'm concerned that the Buckeyes will have a step back reset season for the first time in a long time. So excited, normal, or concerned. What do you think won from the tech subscribers, Bill? Normal. Normal, 49%. And I love when the answers are like this. It's like half are normal, and then the two edges each get a quarter. Okay. So it's 49% normal, 27% concerned, 24% excited. So as an Ohio State fan listening to this, whatever you think, other people are thinking it. What are you thinking? What would you have voted, Bill? I, I would have voted normal. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what like a step back looks like. I, I I, I suppose it looks like 2004. It looks like you lose three or four conference games. You're out of the playoff race, even in 12 team world by the middle of the season. But you feel like something is building and like, man, wait till you see Carnell Tate in 2025 and wait yeah. till you see Air Noland in 2025. Again, that's that's my only reference point. And I think it's the right one for Ohio State fans. They were incredibly successful in 02 and 03. They had a step back season in 04, and the step back in 04 helped them build to 05 and 06 and 07 when they were incredibly successful again. Yeah, that, so that makes sense. I think I think one, it's hard to to answer confidently without knowing exactly what the roster is going to look like, right? If I told the people who are on the concern side that like Travion Henderson and Jack Sawyer are coming back, for instance, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's on the table. I, I think I, I would hope that that would nudge you more in the, in the normal direction. If you're sitting in here thinking this roster is going to turn over in every way we think it can, like every guy who's on the fence, but an NFL decision is going to go and this roster is going to look drastically different. Then, then I, I guess I see how you get to, I'm concerned about a step back. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I, th I think we're going to have a couple guys surprise us. Um, and deciding to come back like from a 2021 recruiting class that there's like six guys who could potentially go that really make or break things i, I guess i wouldn't be surprised if two or three of them end mm. up staying and coming back coming back for next year but we'll see how that goes right there's a lot of time between now and when guys ultimately have to make that decision but so but my it's my belief in that it's not going to be a total exodus and two like kind of even if it is there's still a lot of talent on this roster that i think it'll be a normal season um mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be on the i, I wouldn't be on the like you know, far end of here we go. Ohio State's ramping up to compete for a national title again. 
but I think they're going to be a playoff team. So that would put me in the middle. Yeah, and I'm not sure. The college football is very different than it was in the early 2000s. I'm not sure step back to reset seasons exist for yeah. programs like Ohio State anymore. I actually think they don't. But I also think, and I think you've done some math on this. I just was texting out the other day between NFL departures, the transfer portal, and the guys who are graduating. I th think like th there's a chance there's between 30 and 35 scholarship players who are gone from this season. I think from last season to this season, they lost more like 17 or 18 scholarship players. So that is a significantly higher degree of turnover. Do you, like, I know yeah. you've looked at some numbers. Does that sound about right? And again, I'm not necessarily necessarily saying that that's good or bad. It is just different from what we had last year. Yeah, so we're already at, so there are 12 transfers and four guys we know are out of eligibility. So we're at, at 16 already. And if like we've kind of thought all along that this could be a double digit draft class, right? So mm -hmm. so that gets you closer to thirty. Yeah, I, I think so. I'd probably say under thirty, but close to it. Okay, I might take over thirty, but yeah. Okay, uh, let's start. I also will say I just want to thank the dude. So tech subscribers can give their name. Some of them don't actually give. I guess their real name. So someone named the dude who just sent some photos of himself uh, with his Ohio State tattoos and just was like bringing the passion. And I love when people bring the passion. Uh, he had a rant that like was explaining, and it's not the first time I've heard this, how when he first started listening to podcasts I was on, he thought I was annoying. And <laughs> then like over time, he kind of like got used to me. So um, the dude had a lot to say about college football. The dude is mad, like a lot of other people are, about the fact that Michigan is in the playoff, and suddenly it seems like the sign stealing is gone. And the controversy is about Florida State. And it's like, well, what about the controversy about this team that was credibly accused of cheating by its own conference being the one seed? And like, that's gone. So we'll get more to that later. But the dude's mad about that. But I just want to shout out the dude for uh, pushing through my annoyance, which is also what my wife did, which I think is just what people, which maybe you did, Landis. Come on. Oh, We've never, known each no. other since 14. Ari Wasserman and I picked you up in a Walmart parking lot and drove to. And was it? Yeah, Fort. Where did we drive? We drove to we drove, Baltimore. We, yes, we. You. We, I. I met the two of you in a Walmart parking lot in Cambridge, Ohio. Okay. And then, we, and then we drove to Baltimore. Yeah. We drove to Baltimore for the Navy game. Yes. Which was on my birthday, and then we were like trying to like go get dinner, and we couldn't find anywhere, and I was all pissy. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find a birthday dinner on a, on a football game day, and you at some point had to have thought to yourself, "Dear God, what have I got myself into?" It was not, I would not say that I had to push through annoyance. It was pushed, it was pushed through the intensity, I think, <laughs> is, is, is how I would put it. Uh, to real, to realize that it was coming from a good place. Yeah. Uh, I think those might be similar words <laughs> there. I think you're trying to be nice about it, which I appreciate. All right. So let's get into the rants. Uh, I want to start with um, our guy, Kyle, who, who I just think is in a good place about everything. Nothing is bothering me. Everything is fine. Why do Buckeye fans have to be so entitled? So what that we lost three straight to Michigan? So what that we're 0-9 and, and chasing our goals the last three years? So what that Michigan cheated twice and the NCAA will probably do nothing? So what that our five-star quarterbacks for consecutive years stink? So what that we're not even in the mix for the top portal quarterbacks? So what that we lost a top 10 player in this year's class to a crappy ACC team? Recruit, he means. So what that our starting, starting quarterback said that Michigan is just another game? So what that we don't know who our athletic director will be going forward? So what that I spend $15,000 a year now on season tickets and donations to lose every big game? So what that I get a text every day from a prick Michigan fan friend taunting me? So what that it's cold and rainy and crappy and football is over? Everything is fine, Doug. Everything. See? That's some, fantastic. Some, <laughs> some some people are fine. Some yeah. people need to rant. And then Kyle is just, he's fine. It's great perspective. Yeah. It's great. I love when the people, I love when they bring, I love when they bring the juice, but sarcastic juice is the most flavorful it's, juice. Is it not? Great. It certainly is. Yeah. I would, I do want to like, what's he, the five-star quarterback thing? What is, what is that? So mean? I guess he's talking about that Kyle and Devin Brown, maybe as back-to-back five-star oh, quarterbacks got it. Okay. are not got what it. people have. Not CJ, not CJ, okay. not got CJ, it. not got CJ. Not CJ. All right. Let's talk about 
the season. Because I said you can you can rant about Ohio State, you can rant about college football in general, you can rant about life. And we have a absolutely devastating, intriguing, I've never heard it before, rant about life that is coming up. But for now, it's Tanner who says, this is the most boring chalk season I can remember in my whole life. The two biggest upsets were Texas over Alabama and Alabama over Georgia. Otherwise, none of the top teams lost to anybody except other top teams. It stunk. I do think there I've seen people like reference that 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 Oklahoma win over Texas was again was like the only one I think where where a top 10 team lost to a team outside of the top 10. Like this is factually true, right? It's mm -hmm. not just something Tanner feels like the numbers show it. What do you think of that, Landis? Is this something worth ranting about? Yeah, I, I well, <clears throat> I don't I don't know that I'd rant about it. Like I, I agree with the sentiment, right? I, I think I think we like the chaos of college football, and you know, some years are less cha chaotic than others. But I, but I do think you can bank on a handful of weeks that like just really get off the rails crazy, and that that really didn't happen this year. Um, so I so I get that, and especially like if you're an Ohio State fan, and like. I don't know. It seems increasingly harder or increasingly more difficult, I think, to like to celebrate the wins because you're looking for the things that were wrong and like asking yourself, like, well, is this good enough to beat Michigan? Is this good enough to win in the playoff? Like, if you, as you're consumed by that, I think you want to be distracted by mm. craziness happening in other places in the country. And you didn't really get that. So, so I think I'm, I'm with, I'm with them here. Yeah. It's one of those things that, um, the, so like only the other best teams, knocked out the other best teams like Washington knocked out Oregon and Alabama knocked out Georgia and Michigan knocked out Ohio state and Texas almost knocked out Alabama. So like, like, Oh, and Ohio state fans, you, you know, they've lived through this, that there is right. College football fans were excited when Purdue beat Ohio state in 2018, because mm -hmm. it's something to talk about. If Missouri, I thought somebody was going to get Georgia during the regular season. If Missouri had beaten Georgia, which I thought had a chance to happen, people would have been talking about that. And the sport in the four team world, I think the sport depended on upsets to help clear the way and make the decision easier. And when there's no upsets, there's too many deserving teams and we see what happens, but also it's exciting. So I do think like in the 12 team world, I well, we're going to have still like exciting upsets that won't be as punitive to the team that loses, right. but it still will be super exciting for the team that wins. And I think people think that's one of the great things in college sports. And I think we were denied that to some degree this year. Yeah, it's the, it's it's seeing that underdog team win. But then also, look, if you are if you are a fan of in the top tier of college football, it's also fun to talk crap about a team that, mm -hmm. <laughs> to a team that loses a game like that. Yeah, there just weren't. There weren't many opportunities for that this year. Like, I think people would have done it. I mean, if Maryland had found a way to beat Michigan, like the week before yeah. the Ohio State game, and similar to to Maryland against Ohio State last year, like I think a lot of college football would have really grabbed onto something like that. And and it just yeah, there wasn't, there really wasn't anything like that this year. Um, maybe yeah. a couple a couple close shaves, but but nothing nothing yeah. no no results that got you there. Yeah, we need to get it back. We will. Yeah. We'll get it back. We'll get it back. All right, this one's about Alabama. This is our guy. Chris, uh, let's see. I'll say that Nick Saban is clearly a legend and the greatest college football coach of all time. With that said, I can't stand the narrative around this Alabama team. They are not a scrappy team full of tryhards. <laughs> they are the most talented team by composite ranking of all time who was profoundly underperforming to start the year. It isn't his greatest coaching job ever. It was nearly his worst and that it turned into this is typical. So, I mean, this is one of these, right? Like Saban and these guys, everybody who's a who's a favorite wants to be an underdog. So the idea that you lose to Texas and you get to have an underdog narrative that follows you into your opportunity to win another national title, yeah. that is kind of, it's annoying. It is annoying. There's like uh, seven first round picks on their, on their defense and probably a couple on their offensive line. And like they just had to get quarterback figured out. Like I, I, I don't know. It, it's an interesting perspective. Like I guess I, I, I don't consider Alabama scrappy underdogs. You can't with their talent level. I actually do think this is one of Nick Saban's better coaching mm. coaching jobs, given how they were set up on offense this year and like figuring out a way to make that effective, 
and uh, kind of coaching around some of the limitations that Jalen Milrow has, because like Alabama has had has had a similar quarterback standard to Ohio State the last couple of years in terms of like first round guys who were incredibly productive. That's not really what Jalen Milrow is, and yet they they found a way to maximize that offense despite that. So I actually find that impressive, but I don't. Yeah, you'll never hear me call him scrappy underdog Alabama. Um, I'm actually surprised that Michigan's favored in that game. Now, like mm. the more I, the more that I've thought about it, I think I said when we initially did the Kings of the North playoff show, they're like, yeah, Michigan should be favored. But like with a, a couple of days to digest that, I actually am a little surprised that Michigan's favored in that game. Yeah, it is. I do think it's fair in this day and age, especially with the portal. You know, Bama has just had some holes in the roster in in recent years. They continue to just like have to patched together their receiver core from year to year and that they got in this place at quarterback where they had to bench their starter and bring in a Notre Dame guy who's now going to go play lacrosse like they that they didn't have a better more definitive answer at quarterback I mean to me this would be like if if I don't if people were like oh scrappy underdog Ohio State man they had to go get a left tackle from San Diego State what a bunch of scrappy underdogs Ohio State is how did they what what credit to them and I don't know from our perspective was that the was that the view? Oh, that was not man. the view. Was the, our view was the opposite. Yeah. The underdog tackles here. Just what a what a bunch of scrappy scrappers. Oh, look at Justin Fry scrapping. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure years of recruiting misses a tackle, but ah, the scrap, the scrapping. <laughs> no, there's no reason that Bama shouldn't be great at everything. So, like again, they kind of get the back in because their their loss, which usually is punitive, was not punitive right. in this case. And so, I think it's I think it's a good rant. It's worth ranting about. Yeah. Let's talk about Quinn Ewers. This is Brian. This is, I love this. He starts his rant by saying, oh boy, rants. <laughs> Three <laughs> exclamation points. That's how you approach the rant podcast. A lot of heat has come on Ryan Day and Corey Dennis about Kyle McCord's quarterback play. As a fan, I understand the Haskins field Stroud level is a high bar to maintain. I feel like McCord's shortcomings were identified early in his development, which is why they recruited Quinn Ewers hard. I believe they took a risk and pushed the boundaries of early enrollees in hopes that this year's team would be Quinn Ewers' team. With Ewers, we are in the playoff. In summation, it wasn't a coaching miss. It was identified. The Ewers gamble didn't pay off, and they did the best they could to keep the ship afloat. So again, this is complicated. Quinn Ewers, Quinn Ewers started off one year younger than Kyle McCord in his class. He reclassified and wound up in the same class as Kyle McCord. The Ewers thing was messy, but I, I think the most interesting part of this rant is Ohio State would be a playoff team with Quinn Ewers. So I do think it's worth having a little Quinn Ewers rant discussion here. Yeah, I, I don't. I could probably get there. I, I don't know. And it's hard because like, I didn't watch every game that Quinn Ewers played. Right? I watched the Big 12 championship. He was really good in that game. I've watched some other games where I thought to myself, like, this guy doesn't look like he knows doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. His numbers, aside from completion percentage being better, are like basically the same as Kyle McCord's. So I, I don't know. I don't know that I'd make that def- definitive of a leap, but I think Quinn Ewers' ceiling is is higher than Kyle McCord's. Like I think you could feel more confident in Quinn putting together the kind of game you need to win in the playoff than Kyle McCord, if that makes sense. So if that's the thought process that then I am on board with that. Um, it's just like, I, I don't know the, the situation's weird. Like Ohio state didn't want Quinn Ewers to enroll early. They had no choice when he decided he wanted to do it. So like it became a messy situation from that point forward that I just felt kind of impossible for me to, to, if I'm in Ohio state shoes to handle, um, because Ryan Day, like as he just did with Kyle McCord, was not going to guarantee Quinn Ewers a starting job before he actually competed for it, and and that wasn't good enough for Quinn Ewers and his family, so they decided to go back to Texas, which I don't I don't fault them for. It certainly worked out for them, but I don't I don't know that Ohio State mishandled anything with Quinn Ewers. It was just like their hands were kind of tied when the number one kid in the class and the best quarterback recruit we've seen in a while in terms of rating decided that he wanted to enroll early. Like Ohio State's not going to say no to that, but it wasn't their idea and it wasn't their plan. They just kind of became. Um, entangled in something that was really complicated. I don't blame them from the Ewers thing exploding, but when you're Ohio State, you certainly could have miraculously saved it. And the story becomes, man, I'll tell you what, hey, this Quinn, man, Quinn, remember when you were almost out the door? Remember when you were like, I'm taking my kombucha, I'm going back to the Lone Star State? And then Corey Dennis came over with with some uh, rooster's wings and you hung out. And you watched, um, you know, you watched The Wire for a couple times, to- you know, watched a couple episodes of The Wire, and you talked about life. And that's the story of how Ohio State, like, that's what Ohio State should do, right? That's the kind of thing that happens all the time. Like, yeah. you hear stories like, I mean, I, you know, 
if you talk like Trayvon Henderson was thinking about leaving and like the, he stayed and look how much how that what the value he had to this team. So that but Trayvon kind of, Henderson wasn't also behind C, the CJ Stroud well, of running backs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was never going to happen. It's it's not an apples to apples. I I agree. There's like there's the I, this is what I want to do, and then there's also like the the lineup in your room. So the thing that we have to keep in mind is Quinn Ewers. Ohio State was always going to have a first year starter in 2023, as it turned out, because nobody was obviously going to take CJ Stroud's job last year. So Quinn Ewers at Texas this year is a second year starting quarterback, and the, had the benefit of what he did last year. For instance, last year in November. Texas lost to TCU 17 to 10 and Quinn Ewers was 17 of 39 for 171 yards. That's a 44 uh, com completion percentage, right? Like against a playoff team, like the biggest game of the year, Texas is headed to the playoff. Quinn Ewers, you have a chance to stop it. They score 10. Yeah. So like that. And, but he got to have a whole year. So um, it's not apples to apples, but I don't like, I feel this rant though, mm -hmm. because I do think that it's possible that end of the year, first year starter Quinn Ewers in 2023 in Columbus would have played a better game against Michigan than Kyle McCord did, or would not have made a couple of the killer mistakes, right? Yeah. And then you you get a little bit of a better game there, and Ohio State's the number one seed in the playoff. So I don't I don't think it's a it's not a crazy rant to me. I get I get where the rant's coming from. It's not it's not a crazy rant. And I, I probably agree with that, but. And had Quinn Ewers not decided to enroll early for kombucha money, that very much could have been the reality. But he chose to leave high school early and come to Ohio State at a time where it didn't make sense for him to come to Ohio State. So, like, I, I, I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is, like, you're right to you're right to think that way because I think I do agree with you that they'd be better off this year if Quinn Ewers was their quarterback. But it was just never going to happen once Quinn and his family made that decision. Unless Ohio State had performed a miracle of relationship building. <laughs> in the three months that he was here that fall. And yeah. that somehow they had said, um, whether it was CJ or whether it was Marv and Emeka or, or, and be like, you, this guy has to be your best friend. Like, yeah, have, I guess you have I to do, do that. This. Yeah. Like you yeah. understand the situation you're in and go above and beyond to like, make that kid feel really loved and, and do whatever you can to get on the stay. Which right. I, th I think is, is probably a fair criticism that Ohio State did not do that. Yeah, that's all. Okay. No, it's, it's not, uh, but it's a good rant. I'm glad somebody brought that up because it was a different perspective, and I'm, I'm glad we had it. Let's go to, to Kyle, who's talking about gambling and TV. I may be a hypocrite because I do sports gamble, like $3 bets, which immediately this text caught my eye because I love Three dollar bets. Mm -hmm. I just I lost so many three dollar bets on the NBA playing games on a Tuesday night. Totally wrong. Had the Suns and the Knicks six bucks right down the toilet. So love the three dollar bets. But I absolutely hate how much gambling and TV are intertwined with football now. People are using the Vegas lines to justify Florida State being left out. The lines shouldn't matter. Otherwise, why even play the games? Just pick the four highest power rated teams if that's what you want. Um, and then the other one is, I hate how TV matters so much. I'm not naive. I understand how much TV revenue impacts decisions in the sport. But when people say this is a bad matchup for TV ratings or things along those lines, I again say, why do you care? You're not a TV executive. So I, I totally get this, Bill. Like, we understand gambling and TV revenue and ratings are part of it. But, but like, why do fans care? Why are they shoving it down fans' throats sometimes? To think of your money? <laughs> no, I know. Like they already have it. Yeah, they already. Yeah, yeah. No, I get. I, I, I also feel hypocritical at times because, like, one, we do a gambling show on this podcast, and two, like, I gamble a decent amount. Uh, similar, like three dollar bets at a time. Nothing, nothing crazy. Um, but even with all that, I'm just. I do feel like it has infiltrated the coverage of the sport in a way that I do find um, pretty annoying. That also like takes away from more substantive conversation about the game and about the players. So. Um, yeah, I'm with you. That's a good rant. I think it's very important to separate gambling coverage still. I don't think that gambling coverage should be folded into everyday conversation about the sport. Now, if you give the line, that is just a way to approximate what people are thinking about who's going to win. 
But I think if we're going to talk about who's going to cover and, you know, other things like that, that's better done in sep very clearly separate gambling content that people can opt into. But I don't think it should be part of the major overall like, hey, it's a pregame show. Let's dive in on a parlay. It's like some people don't want that. Right. And just and like the TV ratings, I think, for instance, Ohio State's TV ratings are through the roof. That factors into why Ohio State is so powerful, why Ohio State has so much money, why the Big Ten has such a big TV contract. All that matters. But it's not what you should be talking about when you're getting ready to discuss, you know, the Ohio State Penn State game. Like that's not a primary thing. So I do think some of the coverage now does a bad job. Gambling is too much of a focus for the normal everyday coverage. Yeah. I think I think that's but I, I think sadly it's probably only going to get worse, right? Like I it does feel like the gambling companies are just like initial like just now getting ingrained in that stuff and it's going to increase I think over the next couple of years. Yeah. Unfortunately. It, it doesn't mean that you, you can't have Kings of Columbus brought to you by DraftKings, but it's just I don't every conversation is not a what's the gambling line what's the over under on somebody's passing yeah. games and i do think i am annoyed by using vegas lines as a way to determine what team should get to play where because someone brought this up the other day on sunday after like the florida state controversy and and someone said to me florida state would have been whatever like a 12 or 13 point underdog to anybody else in the playoff and i said what was the betting line on miami ohio state in 2002 and it's 12 point betting line so if somebody back then would have said well ohio state shouldn't be one of the final two teams they're a 12 point underdog to miami but the, right. like, they're undefeated and you say yeah but they won like seven games by one score put somebody else in there's only two yeah. spots ohio state's not going to win like right like that's that's not what it is like Vegas, it, when, when someone uses a Vegas line as a definitive, this is why a team should be in or not, it does make me want to punch that person in the face. Yeah. So good round. Al Alabama was a nine and a half point favorite in the Sugar Bowl in 2014. There you go. Right. So that's why they play the games. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is Rena. Good rant from Rena. In one of the episodes, one of many, where you guys railed against Parker Fleming, you asked the question, are there any adults in the room? The dude is 35 years old, so the answer is no, there are not any adults in the room. He would have been 13 in 2001 when Tressel, Tressel began at Ohio State. Can someone please strap him to a chair and watch all the se make him watch all the seasons of Tressel Ball so he can learn how to coach special teams? Mm. So uh, someone did tag... Uh, tag me on Twitter with a photo of Parker Fleming out visiting the long snapper. Uh -huh. Well, James Laurinaitis can't go anywhere. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Uh, it is funny to me. At, uh, like all the railing that has been done uh, against Iowa and Kirk Ferentz, primarily by me. It's because there's such a heavy focus well no it's because of nepotism but it's because there's such a heavy focus on defense and special teams at, at, like to the exclusion of the offense like they like they, they almost i think it feels like iowa believes that incompetent offense is almost necessary to have good defense and that's not true mm -hmm. i understand playing complimentary football but the complement to good defense is not bad <laughs> offense okay <laughs> But sometimes there's a part of me that wonders if nothing had ever happened with jim trussell and we were now like another 10 years plus into the trestle tenure compared to what we got. And he was a, an established, he's like a two plus decade. He's coming up on Woody territory. If he's still here, whether there would be some things, hopefully not the nepotism, but frankly, Mike Trestle, I'm sure would have been Ohio state's defensive coordinator by now, his <laughs> nephew who's been with was with Michigan state has been with Luke fickle and stuff. Like, I mean, I, I don't, you know, anyway, we could be covering an Ohio State team that is excellent on defense and special teams and can't score. And instead, we're covering an Ohio State team that has a high-flying passing offense, has had problems with, with defense they can't get fixed, and all we do is complain about special teams. <laughs> It's not it's it's not for me it's not merely complaining about special teams though it's about staff structure like how the staff yeah. should look like it's 
that's in my opinion like malpractice <laughs> to have a staff that is that is a balance like ohio state's is when you have an offensive minded head coach you only have four full-time defensive assistants that's wrong it shouldn't be that way you should have five and parker fleming is keeping him from doing that or any special teams coordinator will be keeping him from doing that i don't parker fleming can be the best special teams coordinator in the world i don't think the staff should be built that way i'm gonna mike can we clip bill saying parker fleming could be the best special teams coordinator <laughs> in the world and we'll just Stop. play it's exacerbated by the fact that they've made mistakes on special teams and they have yes. not been good on special teams i do think the first thing is the staff is imbalanced and that is hurting you in recruiting and potentially in in your your defensive uh coaching because you, you're down a guy there but well that's what yeah. Ber berm so berm and, and people might have listened to this but berm and andrew ellis were on talking stuff on wednesday night talking about kingston v amuasa like a, the, a re really good linebacker in this 2024 recruiting class who i think at a, at a time ohio state thought it was going to get and he decided to go to notre dame i believe yes um from but la there's, but Southern there's also LA. a feeling that that's not sealed and that ohio state could potentially get back into it but james r Knight just can't go see him because he's not allowed to so you're like right. you're you're intentionally limiting yourself to go get a impact linebacker while your incompetent special teams coordinator who doesn't recruit is off visiting a long snapper. It's great. Yeah. But also I like the idea of like strapping somebody to a chair and making them watch. It's, it, it is very difficult. A lot of coaches, I saw something, somebody I maybe on an NFL broadcast the other day said like, Oh, you know, this school emphasizes special teams. It's refreshing because nobody cares about special teams anymore. I feel like all head coaches do is talk about special teams. Isn't that yeah. true? Yeah, because, well, I think head coaches who don't coordinate, yes. So, but it, Trestle and Urban were very involved in special teams. And Ryan Day is not. Mm -hmm. Ryan Day is an offensive guy. And so that is a change for fans. I, I do think like, again, if you're going to, if you have three units and like, which unit would you like to be your worst offense, defense, or special teams? I'll pick special teams. Sure. But that's actually not the choice. You're able to be pretty good at all three at a place yeah. like Ohio state. So, um, but I like Rena wanting. Now the one thing about Parker Fleming, because I have had multiple long conversations with Parker Fleming. He has binders. He studies everything. He looks at a million things. I don't think it's that he doesn't have a knowledge base of special teams. They're just still not good at it. So, yeah. But like a tie like a 24, right? Like who is that? Who is that? It's my Gucci, it's my Gucci. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. What is that? What do you see right there? What was that? It was a Ted Kid Jr. punt return for a touchdown. Why don't you do that? Why can't you do that? I can't find another kid. I can't find another kid. <laughs> right? That'd be a good show. I watch that show. Yeah. I could do it. You will be Parker Fleming or should I be Parker Fleming? I will not be Parker Fleming in that scenario. Right, I'll be Parker Fleming and you interrogate me. Okay. With Jim Trussell film. <laughs> I'll just make you watch hours of Terry McLaurin as a gunner. Yeah. This is what it looks like, Parker. Uh, Cam Johnson would come in like like it would be like the end of the interrogation and then like the door would be kicked in and there'd be a guy with an Australian accent be like oh you're pinning him inside the two <laughs> yeah just like Crocodile Dundee yeah it's great all right um this is Scott this is a good one from Scott Doug here's my rant I am tired of the Buckeyes being reactionary to trends in the sport Late to the portal usage. Michigan used it to get offensive linemen that made them the team they are. Late to NIL, losing players to other programs because they weren't offering what other teams were doing. I feel they have squandered many opportunities and teams in the Meyer and Day era. They seem to always be the bridesmaid, always in the discussion, but seem to find a way to fall short. Um, so, like, this idea of the new era and that Ohio State is not at the forefront, what do you think of that as a rant, Landis? I don't know that I agree with the transfer portal stuff. Like, they went out and got Justin Fields, Jonah Jackson to bolster what was a roster that got to the playoff. Went out and got Trey Sermon to bolster a roster that went to the national championship in 2020. Like, they added Davis and Igbenos in last year. Like, made, made, they, they're not as active, I guess, but I don't know that they're late to it. I think they're just a little more calculated with it than some other teams. Um, even Michigan's like not Michigan has done really good work in the portal. They're not bringing in 15 transfers a year. You know what I mean? So maybe they have a better hit rate than Ohio state does, but um, I, I have not had tremendous issue with how Ohio state has handled the transfer portal. 
Um, cause I don't think you build that na consistent national championship contending rosters by bringing in double digit transfers every year. Um, the NIL stuff I get, like they were slow to that. They just weren't organized with it. Um, and I do think that's had a pretty tangible impact on the way that they built their roster the last couple of years. seems like they're in a better place, but, um, compared to their peers at the top of the sport, they are, they are lagging behind. Um, so I think that is a fair criticism that I agree with. I do think this is a typical situation where the duality of Ohio State puts them in a maybe not difficult, but an intriguing spot that can be difficult to navigate because they want to be everything to everyone. They want to have the higher standards and way of doing business that is associated with the Big Ten and frankly, the North. And yet they want to compete with the uh, death or football ideas in the South. So when it comes to the portal, I do think like it's an interesting mission comparison, but like they recruit better than anybody in the North and then anybody in the Big Ten by far. So they have more talent. So they should have fewer holes. So they should have less of a need to go in the portal. Mm -hmm. Right. So sometimes when you see other teams being more active in the portal, it's like, well, they're trying to catch up to Ohio State's talent level. And I think mostly agree with you that they have been selective. Certainly it was a talking point when they did not pursue Eli Ricks in the portal because they wanted to keep Jordan Hancock and J.K. Johnson on track as young corners. And then it turns out that like Eli Ricks was not hugely impactful at Alabama. Jordan Hancock turned into a great player for them. J.K. Johnson didn't work out, but they just traded him for Davis and Igbignosin, and that was a great trade. So I think the, the portal stuff, I agree with you. And then I do think they were trapped early on in NIL by – their view of themselves and the fact that they have had NCAA scandals in the past. Mm -hmm. And I do think that hovers over for Gene Smith. I think that hovers over stuff. Now he wasn't here for Merlise Claret, but he came in right on the heels of that. And he certainly was here when they had to get rid of their head coach because of NCAA stuff. And he was here when he and urban Meyer got suspended for Zach Smith. Mm -hmm. And so I do think it makes them tread cautiously when things are starting. And I think they are more apt to want to follow the letter of the law than some other schools who are A, in the South and don't care, or B, have not had as many NCAA issues as them. And I absolutely think that factored into their, let's say, slow start to NIL. Yeah, I, I, that's that's something that I felt the first couple years of it was like they were being, in my opinion, needlessly cautious because they were worried about the NCAA doing something in regards to NIL that I, I just don't think is ever going to happen or else we, we would have seen more action on that front already. I, th I thought it was pretty obvious. They NCAA sort of advocated responsibility for everything involving NIL, made it the Wild West. Which, and we can talk about whether or not that was good for the sport or not, but it was the reality. And Ohio State, for some reason, was still reluctant to kind of get its hands in there and, and do what was necessary to be as competitive as, as it needs to be. And frankly, like I still I still think it has some hes hesitancy. Um, whether, whether that's merely because of resources or, or sort of ideology, I, I don't, I don't think they're, they're not all the way there with competing against the teams that do this, um, most aggressively. And I don't know that they ever will be. Yeah. And, and I do think we're going to get to, there's some stuff at the end that I save for the end because it's really more complex and about the future of the sport and the thing that new NCAA president, Charlie Baker proposed on Tuesday, which is a world where athletic departments that want to could pay players directly. You would fold NIL into the athletic department. And I do think, for instance, that would be significantly better for Ohio State than what yeah. it is now. But we're going to save that until the end. But for a fan to rant about the idea that it feels like Ohio State seems slow, I don't think is, is a wrong feeling. And it, I think part of it is because in so many other ways, money, TV, stadium, you know, amenities, like all the sports they have, they are, they want to be first. They want to be at the front. And so when they're, whenever they're not at the front, I think it's okay for Ohio State fans to say, why aren't they? Yeah, for sure. And I think to, to the point of the transfer, because there might be people listening to this, like screaming offensive tackle, offensive tackle, offensive tackle like that. That last year, I do think was mishandled, right? They, I just don't, yes. they were not. And the two conversations probably go hand in hand. It's like, were, were they positioned to be, as aggressive as it needed to be in the portal to get a top flight tackle last year, maybe not in terms of NIL resources, but even then it felt like they really weren't pushing the envelope to find um, a better tackle than the one they ended up getting. And I know that Jonah or excuse me, Josh Simmons um, season ended up being like kind of okay, but there were some other tackles out there that Ohio State could have gotten who had better seasons and, and they didn't do it. 
All right, let's talk about Common Accord. And we're going to wind up talking a little bit about the portal here as well, okay. not, uh, not surprisingly. This is Jared. I want to complain about the beat, meaning the people who cover Ohio State, overrating Kyle McCord. I'm hearing people say that there aren't many upgrades over McCord in the portal. That's ridiculous. Cam Ward, Dylan Gabriel, and Riley Leonard are all easily upgrades. I have never seen a quarterback worse in the pocket than Kyle. Um, so sorry, I was just saying like he doesn't think the Kyle McCord is that good. Uh, Marv had over half of McCord's touchdowns. Let's not even start with the problems in the red zone. So the thing I'm curious about that is like, do you feel like we, and we did, we did a huge preseason show about the quarterback situation. We did a mm -hmm. huge Kyle McCord specific show in the middle of the year. Do you feel like it will take responsibility for what we say? Did we overrate Kyle McCord? Yeah, pro probably. I think, I, I think maybe in an effort to try to be fair or at least like not hypercritical maybe it came off as pumping him up a little more than we should have so if that if that's what happened i guess i i, I could see that i don't know like personally i felt like i was fairly consistent with my analysis of kyle mccord just like he's good but i'm not sure he's good enough kind of thing but mm -hmm. um yeah, I, I I think I understand where it's coming from, right? Especially now, and it's easier to say I think in hindsight now that he's gone, it didn't really work out. But yes, I think I think there was a general tone of positivity around Kyle McCord that, while maybe coming from a good place, probably came off as a little disingenuous. I think there was. Um, I think we certainly in the preseason pod were sort of like, listen, like don't freak out yet. It's a competition. They have two good candidates in the competition, and there's a pretty decent chance that this is going to work out, at least to the level that it needs to work out. And in the end, I think the thing that I'm like most surprised on is the, that it wasn't a steady upward to direct trajectory and that we saw mm -hmm. some first half struggles late in the year, just the inexcusable throw that led to the pick against Michigan that changed that game that you would think, okay, that's like a September kind of thing, and it was still happening in November. So... Um, it is a difficult thing. We work for the viewers and listeners and readers and fans who care about this team and are willing to invest time and energy and often money uh, into that passion. And so those are the only people that we work for and we owe them nothing but the truth. But like, I think sometimes the truth is like, just wait and see, right? We, you can't freak out or assume bad things after two games or after four mm -hmm. games or after half a season like it's still right and trying to provide context i think is very important and i think um and the fact that they remain amateur athletes and young men and not seasoned millionaires i still think is is a is worth factoring into this it's not the same as criticizing you know Daniel Jones, right? Or yeah. Zach Wilson is like, oh, they can just go fall back on their pile of money and they're adults. So that always does factor into it. But I never certainly intentionally like never said anything I didn't believe. I never tried to, I don't think we would ever land us like try to be untruthful in the name right. of like protecting Ohio State. But I do think um, being a little circumspect and and saying like, well, let's like not get and that's the thing sometimes, too. It's like if you look back and say, I knew this guy wasn't going to be good enough after two games. I was right. It's like, well, I don't know that anybody could be right after two games. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it did turn out that the 12-game sample then proved that maybe the two-game sample was right. But, you know, also the Notre Dame drive, right? So, I mean, it's uh, right. it was a very difficult season, I think, of QB evaluation. And there certainly were people. And it's been brought up to that. I mean, like Zach Smith, I think, was more directly critical or questioning of, of Kyle McCord all the way along. Um, and I just, you know, if, if that would be, if that path by anybody would be viewed as correct now, I don't know that it would make me go out the next time and like after four games think uh, I'm out on this guy. Yeah, I mean, like you said, <clears throat> you just try to say what you think, right? And and and, yeah. I, and and I think that's that's what we were doing with with Kyle. Like, it's a, it's a, it is an interesting thing. Like, I'm I'm not of the mind that like, oh, these kids are getting nil money now. Like, they're fair game to, to criticize as much as you want to. Like, I don't I don't actually think that's true. Maybe it opens up the the door to be a little more critical, or or to think that a team should be 
I mean, maybe should team team should have a little bit shorter of a leash when there is like a lot of money at stake when you're bringing these players in, and then there's just kind of more on the like there's more on the line tied to their success, I guess, or their failures. Um, so maybe we need to take that more into consideration. But for me, like I guess for why I never went fully on the this guy's this guy's clearly not it train. It's like I was just I kept waiting for that next step. Yeah, and like it never happened. So like it, it then if that was the wrong way to analyze it on my part, then then I'll, then I'll own that. But I just feel like I've seen enough players here kind of get better over the course of the season that I was sort of willing to give Kyle the same benefit of the doubt. And, and I think fairly now after 12 games of watching him play, I don't, I don't think that actually happened. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, but it's worth, again, it's a good rant. It's a good rant by, yeah. by, and, and, and I'm always in favor of any kind of rant that calls out the coverage yeah. of your favorite team, because we need to be held accountable just like everybody else. It's like, we try to hold everybody else accountable. We need to be held accountable as well. Sure. Uh, this is Ryan. I'm a little upset that McCord left. I felt like he could have taken a big step forward next year. Um, do you have the same thoughts or, or am I delusional? Right? So, uh, I wouldn't say delusional, but I certainly am not of the opinion of like, oh my gosh, wait until Kyle McCord has like another, you know, has a year, full year under his belt. I think there's going to be a huge leap because I felt like there wasn't a huge leap during the course of the season. Yeah, I, I don't think it's delusional either. I guess for me, like the, the thing now that, that I think back on, and actually I heard um, Aaron Rodgers was talking about this as it relates to like Jordan Love and the young quarterbacks in the NFL and how they're evaluated and like how, how much of a leash you should give them until it's time to... Um, like pull the plug or be, be hypercritical of them. And he said, he said that like, we're often too quick to be critical of those players, but also too, you, you should be able to see flashes in that first year of, of, of greatness to come, even if it's not consistent. And I don't know that we saw that with Kyle McCord. Like, I, I think we saw fine quarterback play at times. I don't know if we ever saw like that next, next level stuff that frankly, like Ohio state fans have been accustomed to and, and what the standard is at, at Ohio state. So the fact that we didn't see that all that often or really at all um, leads me to believe that there was not a, a like a gigantic next step for Kyle. Mm -hmm. here. Uh, last one on McCord. This is Sean. The more I am following this, the more I think the Buckeyes are going to be stuck at quarterback. I also feel like I'm one of the only Kyle McCord defenders based off of social media and a variety of platforms and podcasts. Gillen, uh, Dylan Gabriel from Oklahoma was the only appealing transfer to me, and that's looking like Oregon is the front runner. I'm not convinced that the guys in the room are, are good enough for next year, but I would have been comfortable with McCord. It seems like all the people suggesting portal quarterbacks are just watching highlight reels and not full games. Heck, mm -hmm. um, two of the Heisman Trophy finalists were trading interceptions at a crucial time in the last game. Talk about Michael Penix and Bo Nix. McCord wasn't that bad. It's hard to win college football games, and he was 37 yards from being undefeated, even after a huge mistake. There was no C.J. Stroud around. Um, in comparison to the field, McCord was fine, maybe just not to Ohio State's past. But we aren't playing historical teams. We are playing the field in 2023. So I thought that was a good one from Sean uh, in Lewis Center, saying like, hey, man, I think we might miss this guy. I think we maybe overreacted to this. It, it could work out that way. I don't, I don't know that I'm convinced of that. Um I, I guess I, I could see why you would be unenamored with what's left in the room because like Devin Brown had a chance to beat Kyle McCord for the job and he didn't do it. Um, but that's not like Devin Brown is also a year younger than Kyle McCord. So like, I, th I think there's, I think it's reasonable to hold out a little bit of hope that Devin Brown could develop some more being, being that he is a little bit younger. And I think there's reason to like Lincoln Keenholz and, and Aaron Oland, albeit he'll be a true freshman, but, um, and I don't know. I think, I think there are potential, like serious upgrades over what Ohio state had last year um, in, in the portal, potentially like Michael Pratt, if he goes in the portal, I think would be an upgrade. I think Riley Leonard, if they were able to get him would be an upgrade. Even Dylan Gabriel in some respects, I think could be an upgrade. Um, so I get it. Like it's not, there's no guarantee that you're going to be better, but I, and it's the other part of it too, is like, it's not like Ohio state told Kyle McCord to go kick rocks. They just said like, yeah. we're not, we're not, going to guarantee you the starting job because we have a competitive room. We want to make sure we have the best guy for 2024. And then he decided to leave because of that, which is fine. That's his prerogative. But um, it's not like Ohio state was necessarily willing to just push him out the door. It's just kind of the world. It's the world that we're in right now where if you can't guarantee somebody a job, then they're probably going to go elsewhere. And that's what Kyle did.
Yeah, I certainly think some people have characterized this as Ohio State forcing out Kyle McCord, and I don't think that's fair. And I think it would have been irresponsible to the rest of the team in the program to like guarantee him the starting job next mm -hmm. year. So, so I think I think you you said that very well. A couple quick survey results again from our tech subscribers. If you want to be a tech subscriber, you know it's an interesting time to do it. Things are happening with the roster. You can do it for a two week free trial at six one four six six two four five zero nine. You send a text to that number. You get back a link to sign up. Like, you know, you can do it for uh, Christmas, right? So it's hard, like, yeah. it, you know, you, you have to like, if you want to do it that way, you have to send it from your phone, right? From the phone that you're signing up with. Um, so you also, if you're like trying to like give it as a gift or something, you can sign up this way, which is, let me think. Because <laughs> I've had people ask this, Landis, of like, I want to give it as a gift. You can go to this link. It's joinsubtext.com. So joinsubtext.com backslash the podcast OSU. And then there's a way to sign up there too. And you can then, instead of it being from your phone number, you can put in a phone number. So anyway, makes a great gift. That's right. Especially you if you're the cancel after the two week free trial. Yeah, it doesn't cost yeah. anything. Dug, dug in your pocket for the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> going to give that uh, give that to my family and uh, they will kill me. What is the closest to your thought about Kyle McCord entering the transfer portal? Survey question. 68% said, I may be surprised he's leaving, but that's college football now. 25% said, I'm glad he's leaving. It's better for OSU. And only 7% said, I'm very worried that he's leaving. So, you know, that's like 70% land is saying like, man, it's just kind of life mm -hmm. and less than 10% being worried. Scale of one to 10, your thoughts about the Ohio State quarterback situation for 2024. 10 is things will work out great. One is I'm very worried just about the quarterback situation. What do you think the, the final rating was between one and 10 for that, Bill? 7.3. 6.3. Oh. So like a, a little under that. Still, you know, anytime, anything within a full point is a good guess by you. Okay. So you still right. are in the range. So like not like a, a little trepidation there for sure. What do you want Ohio State to do at quarterback for 2024? Get a one-year portal veteran who won't affect the young quarterback pipeline. That's 51%. Fine with no portal guy. Let Brown, Keen Holtz, and Aaron Nolan battle it out. 46%. And only 4% said get a young portal guy that might blow up the room. So it's about half and half on veteran portal guy or stick with what you got. Your prediction, who starts the most games at quarterback for Ohio State in 2024? Portal quarterback, 42%. Tied at 27%, Keen Holtz and Brown, and then 4% going with the young guy, Aaron Nolan. Is there anything in there that surprised you, or does it sound about right? I'm surprised that Brown and Keen Holtz are tied. I thought, you think, okay. I thought maybe Keen Holtz would be higher. So there's certainly, it feels like there's a Keen Holtz hive, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like there's a Devin Brown hive. Yeah, Mar Marvin anymore. Harrison Sr. is part of it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, what do we think of that? Wasn't wasn't Marv Sr. throwing a little QB shade during the year? He like tweeted a picture of CJ, or not tweeted, uh, put a picture of CJ in his Instagram story and then uh, followed it up with a picture of Keen Holtz. Yeah. Interesting. Why does why does it feel like people are not as juiced about Devin Brown? I think, well, because the, he's already been in the competition and like quote unquote didn't win. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've seen some of like people who think they've seen enough of game action from Devin Brown to come to that conclusion. And I, I'm not there. I, I actually would like to see Devin Brown play the majority of the cotton bowl, if at all possible to, to get a better feel for what he could potentially bring to the table. But I, but I think it's because they view him as like of, of similar ilk to Kyle McCord. Okay. And, it, and you have said he was not like as athletically explosive with his mobility as maybe people expected the couple times we did see him. Yeah, more more powerful it seems than like Wiggly, which I, I thought he'd be more more elusive. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on from Kyle McCord. We have a bunch of other stuff to get to. Let's. This is an interesting one from uh, Lucas. My rant is about the certainty of James Laurinaitis being a good linebackers coach. Everyone has wanted him to be hired as a full time assistant. I understand former players help against Michigan, but. Everyone is also under the impression he is essentially already coaching the linebackers. Look at how much worse Tommy and Steele were this year compared to last year. I'm not saying he will sure be bad, for sure be bad, but we need to slow down on this guarantee that he is going to be a good position coach. He he has never been a full-time position coach, Landis, yeah. so what do you think of this? 
I think it's fair. I, I, I think I would say, one, I, I'm not so sure that the dip in play for Tommy and Steele was more a product of scheme stuff than it was poor coaching or, or not getting developed the way they should. I just think they were kind of asked to do some different things this year compared to the year before when they were kind of hyper aggressive um, and that maybe exposed some flaws or they were probably always there just, just were masked a little bit the year before. Um, I think the one thing that is true about James that we've come to learn is that he's a pretty good recruiter. Like when gets, when kids get on campus, he's really good with them. He's a good relationship builder, like over the phone and like messaging, like all, all that stuff that he's allowed to do. He just can't go on the road and like really forge those bonds. So I, for me, it's more of a recruiting thing. Um, it's like recruiting manpower on the defensive staff, right? Mm-hmm. I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be James Laurinaitis. He's just this the kind of obvious in-house option to give you a fifth defensive recruiter, especially in a world where like Jim Knowles just doesn't recruit a whole lot and he's not a, not a very dynamic recruiter. You definitely need another defensive recruiter, and, and James seems pretty good at that. I think it's fair to be a little circumspect of, of the on-field coaching chops. Um, I don't have a strong lean, I guess, one way or the other on that, but I feel pretty confident that he would up their defensive recruiting immediately if he were given the job. And I do think, right, as as a young coach who had not been a full-time assistant before, I mean, Corey Dennis never played quarterback, Parker Fleming never played special teams, and Keenan Bailey never played tight end, and James Lornite has played linebacker in the NFL for 10 years and is one of the eight right. three-time All-Americans in Ohio State history. So it's like, what makes us think James Lornite would be a good linebacker's coach? He was an excellent linebacker, which is a yeah. which is a starting point. It's not a guarantee, but he was an excellent linebacker, and I think he relates to kids. Yeah. Because as you pointed out, I think we have proof of relating, and we have proof of playing the position, and you combine those two things together, and it would make sense that he'd be good at coaching it. So. Yeah, and I also like I I don't know about you, but like I am of the mind that they need more guys who get it on the, on the coaching mm-hmm. staff like like f- former buckeyes who understand what it is to be a part of the program and most importantly what it takes to to beat michigan so yeah let's do this one this i f- again found interesting and eric i like when people i mean if you listen to me long enough like you under i i just have like i have six or seven tricks in the bag and the rest is just repeating myself for a decade so um <laughs> don't tell anybody This is Eric. Doug, I agree with your sentiment of always take your shot regarding the playoff versus a random meaningless bowl game, which I have expressed many times. Had Ohio State beaten Michigan and would have beaten Iowa and Ohio State was the one seed, then I would be 100% behind the team, behind the team cheering, etc. That being said, a part of me feels like they are sparing themselves a 2016 Fiesta Bowl embarrassment against Alabama. The thought of this iteration of Ohio State going against Nick Saban with a month to prepare for Saban makes me nauseous. So again, we are talking about 31 to nothing against Deshaun Watson and Dabo Sweeney and Clemson in 2016 with a team that, Bill, in that moment, I thought that 2016 Ohio State team should not have made the playoff over Penn State. I did not think that they were going to fare well in the playoff. I did not think of like that that was the first team as a non-champ to make the playoff. I did not necessarily think that team, although it had an excellent road win at Oklahoma, a road win at Wisconsin, like it had big wins. It it it, it had the crazy, obviously, uh, Michigan win in double overtime. Mm-hmm. That was an incredibly flawed team. It was a one-man offense with Curtis Samuel, for instance. It had a great secondary, but that secondary was trying to carry it. Um, I... Although I must admit, when we got to that Clemson Ohio State Fiesta Bowl in 2016, I think the picks on that game were very split. Even even in that world, I mean, that was like a very close two three game. I certainly remember people on the Ohio State beat picking Ohio State to win that game. It wasn't like everybody thought, "Oh my God, Ohio State's going to get smoked by Deshaun Watson." But they did get smoked by Deshaun Watson. Do you think they might have been smoked by Jalen Milrow and Dallas Turner and Nick Saban if they had gotten that opportunity this year? I wrote a story. I I, I just I just found it. <clears throat> December twenty eighth, twenty. Don't, 20, don't 2016. go back in time on the internet. No, no December December twenty eighth, twenty sixteen. Uh, Ohio State can't throw, but recent history shows plenty of national champions couldn't. That was uh, no. for that was for me. Uh, mere days before Ohio State got Speaking shut out. Of being too optimistic <laughs> on the beat. The, the Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> the show is what I know. I guess. Um, I I think I actually disagree with um the sentiment here uh one i think it's mostly this ryan day has coached in three playoff games and he's like kind of had his team ready to roll in all three of them 
that like and I, I get like you're scared of Nick Saban having a month to prepare for for Ohio State. Ryan Day has used that month pretty well in the past. Right? Like 2019 against Clemson, should have won that game. Had had some bad breaks, should have finished a drive or two. But like I think played better than Clemson in that game. Certainly played better than Clemson when they blew their doors off in 2020, and then played really well against Georgia last year. So I. I would have a reasonable amount of faith in Ryan Day, like putting together a pretty solid game plan to attack Alabama. If that's the hypothetical matchup we're talking about, um, does this team have limitations? Sure. Um, I think the 16 defense was probably a little better than Ohio State's defense was this year, at least more disruptive. On the like the defensive line was awesome, um, and so was the secondary. That offense was severely limited. To your point, like they they, they were that headline back then, they couldn't throw the ball. I think they were like 80th in the country in passing offense. This offense was like 20th. So like it wasn't as good as we used to seeing over the last few years, but like it wasn't god awful. I, I I do I I don't know that I would pick Ohio State to beat Alabama if they were playing each other, but I don't know that I would be nauseous or feeling like you're staring down the barrel of a similar result to 2016. And I do think this like and again, it's not like for whatever reason. It's not like we don't understand it. They've they've are more willing to go play their they go play their best game in these scenarios under Ryan Day as opposed to in the Michigan game and as opposed to in the regular yeah. season. So I think the idea of I do, I do think like they would take advantage of the month. I do think, you know, Marv and Emeka and Cade and those guys like give you a chance. And I I think it's a really interesting viewpoint to express. I 1000% disagree with it all the time because to me, it's all about getting a shot and taking your shot and playing a meaningful game, which is why Eric said off the top. But I, I, I find it interesting. And I wonder how many people listening to this right now, are, like Eric made him think like, oh, maybe, maybe I would be worried about that too. Yeah. So I would say we're not in that camp necessarily, but it's interesting. And also like Saban's probably Saban's, I mean, he he got his revenge in the 2020 national title game, but I, I don't. Saban wouldn't be scared of Ohio State. I just like I don't think Saban's scared of Michigan. Um, it would be great. It'd be fun. I mean, we'd be having a fun time. Wouldn't we be having a good time right now? Talking about Ohio State, Bama. Yeah, I thought I thought initially we might we might get lucky and get an Ohio State Georgia rematch in the Sugar Bowl, but uh, yeah, Ohio State Bama would be just as good, if not yeah. better. Yeah. All right, let's do this quick. Uh, this is our guy Andrew. Love Andrew. It seems like I have a unique perspective among Ohio State fans right now because I have no rants. Did we just lose our third straight game to Michigan? Yes. Do we have a firing needed on at least special teams? Yes. Is there uncertainty at quarterback, the position our head coach is known for? Yes. But I'm a lifelong, 23 years old, Ohio State fan who spent the first 16 years of his life living among the enemy in Ann Arbor. I then attended Ohio State and graduated two weeks after being in Ann Arbor to witness our first loss to Michigan since I was 11. All this to say, Ohio State is blessed. As do, so, he's not being ironic here. After yeah, I was gonna say, being, yeah. it's like yeah, you were like, we already did this. It's like, no, yeah. this guy actually means it. Okay. As Doug has researched, Ohio State is the most consistently good program in college football history. We have the largest fan base of any team in any American sport at any level. We're the only team who would have made a 12-team playoff um, the entire past decade. We'll be the only team to make the 12-team playoff the entire next decade. Ohio State fans who have any rants can cram it. So that is hmm. Andrew actually feeling blessed uh, by being able to root for this program. Nice. That, that's that's tremendous. I'm, I'm I'm glad that some people can can find a little peace in that way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I'll find much support for the sentiment given how things have gone recently. That's why it's going to be two percent of our show. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Andrew, we love it. Thanks for expressing it. Nobody else sent that. You were the only one. That was the one rant we got that was like, eh, it's all good. Yeah. All right. We got to take, let's just take a quick break. Reset. Uh, I'm going to guzzle a little Gatorade here and then we'll come back. And th there's a lot we're going to talk about just with like how Ohio State fans think about this team and how other state, other, other Ohio State fans react to that. We'll do that next on Kings of Columbus. All right. Back on Kings of Columbus. I used to do a show, Landis, called Gotta Watch the Tape. And uh, we often talked about on there, sometimes I would turn that show into got to feel the feelings because mm. sometimes it's not just being a football fan. It's not just about like what did you scheme up on third and six. It's about how the sport makes you feel. And we're going to get into uh, a lot of that stuff right now. 
This is Jason. I'm tired of all the angry, ranting Ohio State fans. It is a very spoiled fan base. I lived through the late 80s and 90s as an Ohio State fan, and 9-3 and three was considered a good season. Now, anything less than a national championship is considered a failure. There is way too much negativity around the team. I sympathize with the players who are subject to this negativity. Uh, this is from Shannon. I'm angry at our own fans. I'm going to guess most aren't listeners of this show. But if you check any media platform, the majority of what I see is so much, I don't even want to watch this bowl game. Uh, they just need to end their season. Or um, that Marvin Harrison Jr. would have been an actual Heisman winner without McCord. Or any positive post turning into their own negative rant. Right, You take a New Year's Six Bowl, you make it negative. You take a Heisman finalist, you make it negative. Yeah. It makes me feel confident people won't play um, because won't like it's hard to enjoy the team because how attacked they will be if things go wrong, right? They're saying the fans are in a weird spot and the players are in a weird spot because there's so much ne so much negativity around this. It's unbelievable to me that people can't be happy and proud despite how things have turned out. I'm angry at times and sad about our season, but I'm fearful our fan base has a real chance to hurt our own recruiting. I hope I'm mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, well said by Shannon. And this is a long one from Aaron. I won't real, uh, read all of it, but I hate being an Ohio State fan. I'm not sure this will be read or referenced in any way, but on the off chance it does, I'm curious what other fans feel like. I'm 25 and I've been a fan my entire life. One of my first memories ever existing on this earth is asking my mom the day after the O2 Natty if we had won the night before. We are spoiled, rotten children, and I haven't been much better than anyone else. I'm pretty sure I drunkenly texted a few F-bombs in the Buckeye Talk text after last year's Michigan game, although that had more to do with realizing I spent a good chunk of change to watch them in person get embarrassed two years in a row. So uh, Aaron goes through this to detail, being at a game where Ohio State was beating like a pretty good Purdue team and people were leaving at halftime, like kind of, kind of taking in for granted. And mm -hmm. so Aaron's saying like, he even feels like he's been there before bill. So the main thing here is, and, and whenever we do this, and I felt like a year ago, and again, I've, my position on this has really evolved. I do feel like we are, I don't want to say therapist, but like we are a sounding board. We want to be a sounding board for fans who are angry, upset, frustrated, disappointed, because in the end we want fans to enjoy their team. We mm -hmm. want fans to appreciate, enjoy, have fun with their very successful program. This should better your life, not make your life worse. And if we can talk this out, if fans can share their feelings and people listening and watching this can relate to that, I think that's good. But whenever this happens to Ohio State, this is a common refrain by at least some chunk of the fan base that they feel like another chunk of the fan base is too negative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. I, I think that's a lot because I fall in this trap too. I think it's a lot of like social social media message board stuff, right? Which is not an insignificant chunk chunk of Ohio State fans when you combine all of it together, but it's certainly not everyone. But it, it's it's the loudest. It's the most easily accessible viewpoints, and and I think you you tend to think like, oh, this is how everybody feels, and I don't I don't think that's the case. Um, at least I've changed my I've changed my kind of my my view on that. Um. I, I guess on the other hand, it's like, well, that's the most engaged part of the fan base, and they're and they're all like largely feeling that way. So I, I, I get I get the feelings. Um, I don't know. It's hard. Like, it's hard for me to, I don't know, find the right balance. I guess between like, yeah, like I'm mad, my team lost, like this sucks, and not being overly negative about every little thing. But it's hard. Like, and I, as a sports fan, have definitely gone down the the overly negative road to it do it quite often i think it's in my blood as a philadelphian so um freaking I, birds freaking yeah. 10 and 2 birds lost I to the Niners. yeah right they're terrible because they got their bus kicked for one game so like i i i think I, I i empathize with it um tremendously i just i i guess i would say like it's probably not the majority of the fan base that feel that that actually feels that way and i think if we were ever able to actually compile all the data somehow you would find that it is a relatively small percentage of the fan base that actually feels that way. But it, there, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a percentage of the fan base that is kind of in your face. And I'm not even saying that they're wrong for feeling that way. It's just that um, it's kind of easy to find, and it's, it's less easy to find the people who might be feeling a little differently. 
I do think it's important to appreciate the wins along the way. It's like when people dismiss, like, of course they beat Penn State, whatever. Like, why is that? It's like, I think that's wrong. Like, you shouldn't. Penn State's good. Like, the fact that Ohio State has dominated Penn State, that should not be taken for granted. Right? The fact that um, it's, you know, you don't have to take Rutgers wins. You don't have to appreciate it. You can take a Rutgers win for granted. I give everyone permission to do that. Yeah. You can take an Indiana win for granted. But there are times when it's like you find a way to win. And I've evolved on that of like complaining about wins is not the most fun way. I actually think complaining about wins is worse than complaining about losses. Like, oh, yeah. hey, Ohio State lost to Michigan three straight years. Like, that's not cool. I think that's reasonable to complain about that. To be like, oh, man, I can't believe they didn't look better against Minnesota. It's like, okay, I don't know. Like, what? Like, they're, they're 11 and 0. What do you know? You know? So, um, the main thing I think that you're right and people should know is there are angry fans, but that's not the majority. And so if you feel like the fan base is too angry, you're not alone there. But also, if you are an angry fan, um, maybe expressing that helps you. But I would just encourage along the way to the anger, if you can't help the anger when they lose, I would just really try to appreciate the wins yeah. along the way. So it balances out overall so you're not angry the whole season you're hopeful and optimistic and you're 11 and 0 and then you're angry okay yeah the balance is really important and it's hard it's hard to achieve i think we're all we're all looking for balance in our life right it's hard it's hard we to get want, there I, i'm actually not i'm okay with most you're of okay angry. with where you are a, yeah okay what yeah. 50 what am i gonna change now but like <laughs> and even again we learned the lesson i absolutely learned the lesson learned the learned the lesson live on this show with our post game after notre dame it's like they beat notre dame by an inch they beat notre dame Right. There's a part of that. It's like, man, OK, well, like Notre Dame's pretty good. They won on the road at Notre Dame. Like, don't be mad about a Notre Dame win. Save the mad for the Michigan loss. Yeah, it's like, right. hey, everybody, just in case they lose to Michigan a fourth straight time, make sure you save up your mad. Don't yeah. waste it. Just store That's it all. You're up. really going to be yeah. imagine the, the fourth straight Michigan loss mad. You need 365 days to save up that mad. Yeah. And then guess what? If you don't need it, you can have a party and release it. It'll be like a gender reveal. Right, you put it in a balloon. It's like, oh, what's in there? I'm gonna pop this balloon and it explodes. And uh, I don't know, would it be maize and blue or would it be scarlet and gray in the balloon? I think if it would it's be the anger. It's the if anger. You're releasing your Michigan anger. Yeah, yeah. Maize and blue. Maize and blue. Oh, maize we'll yeah. do that. Yeah. We will do an anger reveal next year. Releasing well, because don't you love watching gender reveals thing? I just watched one the other day. It was like the dad was gonna go dunk a balloon that was either gonna be pink or blue on the inside, and but he was doing it on like an icy basketball court and he slipped <laughs> and fell broke. on his butt. And the balloon, he's like sat on the balloon and it exploded on him. And it was yeah. a boy, hey, it's a boy. Those are my favorite ones when they mess up. I, I the, the one where like, uh, I don't know if it's like a wiffle ball or whatever, but like the wife tosses it up, but she like she like jams her husband so we can't swing it, and it just falls to the ground. It's like oh, it's blue. It's like it's, it's like, a good pitch. Good, yeah. good take, good take, Dad. <laughs> All right, so this is complicated now. <sighs> the NCAA is proposing some stuff. This is from the nine one seven. This idea of paying fifty percent of your athletes is just ridiculous. It sums up what a useless entity the NCAA is for college football. Can we please just pay the players? on the team that brings in all the revenue. The idea that Ohio State is going to pay players in non-revenue sports to keep up, the, up this charade of non-professional athletes is absurd. Football is a huge revenue generator. Let's admit that those players deserve to be paid for it and give them the money. So if people aren't all the way up on this, and we're, we're going to get into it even a little bit more later, Charlie Baker, the new NCAA Prez, proposed a thing that, that athletic departments could choose to opt into to pay players directly. But a requirement of it is you must pay at least half your athletes, at least $30,000 a year. So if, if Ohio State did that, they have a 1,000 athletes that have to pay 500 of them. It's in all sports. It's not just football. That's $15 million. That's 30,000 times 500. They would also fold NIL into the athletic departments, and then that NIL would still act the same way. But it's like Marvin Harrison Jr. would get the $30,000 that the other 500 athletes got. But then Marvin Harrison Jr. could also get a ton of NIL money that most of the other athletes are not getting. Um, very briefly on this, Landis, they, the very difficult thing is balancing the need. And, and frankly, it's just right to pay the players in the most violent, popular sport money. Mm -hmm. it, it is. But you have to balance that with Title IX. I think that Title IX is intended to make sure that the educational opportunities are fairly balanced for men and women. 
I don't think playing a violent, brutal, supremely popular sport is actually an educational opportunity. Yeah. And that we should cut football out of that equation. And maybe the only way to do it is to remove it from the university and you wear the jerseys of the pro of the program, but you're not really part of it, that you're an outside employee, and then it wouldn't be governed by that. Anyway, I think this proposal is a good idea. I understand the rant and I understand the frustration. I I really do think all of this is a step along the way. Yeah. I don't think this is the perfect conclusion, but it is a good beginning of the NCAA president saying let's directly pay players. Yeah, I, I mean, I I agree with the rant where like let's let's just drop the charade entirely and just make players employee employees and get into some kind of revenue sharing model. Um, I think that is inevitable. It's a joke to me that we're not maybe pushing that more aggressively now, but this does feel like a step in the right direction, right? It, it, it feels at the very least better than than what we currently have, which is a total mess. And I also think like we're uh, well, maybe we're going to talk about more how this benefits Ohio State yeah. later on. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll so, save that point. But no. But no. So I think. Steps. Yeah. Yeah. It's steps. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not steps. perfect. It's it's still imperfect, but it's it's a good step. All right. Let's do this about transfers. This is Carl. I feel everyone is seeing all the transfers as a big problem. If you look at the majority of Ohio State transfers, the common factor is they either had injuries or were buried on the depth chart or both. Julian Fleming has reached his max at Ohio State, and good luck to him. Kyle McCord wasn't guaranteed a spot at Ohio State. They can go get um, He can go get a job somewhere else. I don't see the transfers as a huge loss. It's part of college football at this point. So Carl is sort of ranting about if you do think the transfers – 12 guys in the portal right now are a huge loss. Like you're wrong. Mm -hmm. do, do you 12 guys in the portal? Do you see huge loss? Not a huge loss. Not a huge loss. No, I, I think it's a byproduct of and running guys off is probably not the right way to say it, but I, I, I don't really know any other way. Like Ohio state has not been super aggressive at like purging its roster every off season, but I do think eventually you have to be. And I think that's happening now. Like if you want to, if you want to have enough room to bring in your twenty to twenty-five man recruiting class and add a couple guys via the transfer portal, you have to get rid of players. Um, and and most off seasons, Ohio State doesn't. But I think you know every couple of years, if they're going to continue acting that way, every couple of years you're going to have a year that looks like this. And all of the guys who have decided to leave, like I, Kyle McCord and Julian Fleming, I guess are the two biggest impact players. I, I agree with what the texter said about their projections beyond this year. And aside from that, it's like, I don't know, I guess I would have liked to see what Kai Stokes and Jair Brown could have become here, but I'm also not certain either one of them would have been a starter next year. So I get I get why they left, and, and I don't think it's out of the ordinary. I think I think I saw there's like seven or eight teams that have had double-digit transfers out of their program, and, and more teams will be added to that list um, as we conclude through bowl season here. So I, it doesn't, doesn't feel out of the ordinary, and I'm not alarmed by it. And I will say, right, one of the signals to guys of one day I think decide to transfer is, is there a younger guy that's passing you on the depth chart? Malik Hartford getting the opportunities he did to both start early in the year, yeah. and even though it was only one snap against Michigan when they went to six DBs, he was the sixth guy up as a true freshman ahead of Jair Brown, ahead of Kai Stokes, ahead of Cam Martinez, right? I think that mattered. Yeah, so if you sure. think that if, if they're playing Malik Hartford ahead of Kai Stokes, if they thought Kai Stokes was better, they would have played Kai Stokes. And then Malik Hartford wouldn't be lining up the transfer but you have to play who you think can help you the most. So there was a time when I, I certainly was a person who was very interested in Kai Stokes, but if Malik Hartford's ahead of him, I don't know, right? Yeah, and Jahad Carter was also ahead of him, who yeah. could come back next year. So anyway, all right, Urban Meyer leadership. This is Brock. I just miss Urban's big game leadership. It wasn't perfect, but I am reading his book, and he just talks about not worrying about mistakes, but worrying about whether guys are going 100% and playing with relentless effort. And I feel like his teams looked that way and Ryan Day's teams play not to screw up. Urban's teams probably made a few more mistakes, but they played 100 miles per hour and made big plays. I think that's why he occasionally lost one he shouldn't have lost, but uh, showed up against the top dogs, whereas Ryan has played tight a lot, um, not always, but a lot. What do you think of this differentiation? Certainly an interesting rant. Yeah, I, I, I think it's probably right. Um, Urban, I, I, I question now whether a lot of the way that Urban got business done would like resonate with with today's college athletes. And I realize he's, it's, we're not too far removed from him coaching, but I, but I think college athletes are vastly different. But at the time he was doing it, like I don't know that there was anybody better than Urban at getting his team 
geared up and in the right frame of mind and ready to play its best football when it mattered most. Um, the trade-off with that is, is lapses in focus sometimes, I think, when, when you, you just can't really get your team in that way. And, and I think the consistency of Ryan Day week to week has has lent to not having those kind of out-of-nowhere slip-ups, but also probably hasn't maybe had them as locked in as they need to be in, in some of the bigger games. And and which would you rather have, I think, is, is, is a fascinating question because I do think they're two very different approaches. I don't know that you can be both. Um and given the way the last few seasons have gone, I guess I wouldn't fault anybody who was more in favor of the urban approach. Yeah. I mean, it's like players coach, not a players coach, right? I mean, it's like the, the I, I think it sometimes you can be the right coach 360 days a year, and then you wish you could have somebody else for five days a year. And I think that might be the case with Ryan Day and Urban Meyer, just like yeah, the way guys feel in the building and are they happy and healthy and mental health and all those things. But it's like, who do you want? on the last Saturday in November, but like, that's not how life works. Right. Like, often it's one or the other and our greatest strengths are often our greatest weaknesses. And so like, it's a fascinating discussion that probably requires more than 90 seconds on a rant show, but I'm glad it got brought up by Brock. I think it was a smart one. A lot of people are mad about what has happened with Michigan. As we mentioned before that, like the idea that the sign stealing scandal seems to have vanished. There are some specific things that are bad about this is Dave. I'm riled up about Michigan fans. My quote friends and online who are rubbing the three in a row narrative down our throats. I never acted like that over our years of dominance of the rivalry. All this, despite the NCAA possibly damaging their program for years, no denial, just over confidence that nothing will come of it from his Michigan fans. Right. I don't want to be a jerk, but this is making me root for huge penalties for them. Thank yeah. you. I feel better. That's okay. I feel that. Yeah. Eric, the whole situation with the cheating team up north still has me irritated, both with them for being lousy cheats, liars, and sanctimonious weasels, and with the power structure of the NCAA and Big Ten. To essentially let them off the hook with so much evidence is preposterous. The three-game suspension was a cop-out and the minimum they could get away with. The NCAA is going to slow play and bury this like they did with the Kansas basketball scandal. Add that to the nonsense with Connor Stallion showing up at an event with the Barstool folks, and they are laughing at everyone. I didn't know that. He did? Did he show up with, with Portland? Yeah. He, uh, so they were doing their show. We could see him from the press box, right? We could see their little yeah. setup they had there. So there was, uh, there was a point in the show where Connor Stallions walked up onto the stage and handed uh, Portnoy a note that said, like, I don't know what it said, but Portnoy said that it said, like, Ryan Day has cheated even more than Jim Harbaugh or something like that. And then Connor Stallion just walked off the stage. But yeah, he was there. Yeah. He was, he I, was across the street from Michigan Stadium. I, I don't, I mean, I know there's people that like it. I don't like Barstool. So, like, a, a Barstool can cram it. So, Portnoy can cram it. Um, this is a life rant. I've never heard this. I'm blown away by this. We're always open to life rants. I've never heard this. Life rant. Christmas should be January 25th. The current timing of Christmas is bad and dumb and should be changed. Right now, Christmas, a.k.a. one of the best parts of winter, happens five days into the actual season of winter. Think of how great it would be to have Christmas on January 25th. You have Thanksgiving properly dedicated to food, football, family, and friends. No way too early holiday cheer. The game gets to be, I think we're trying to move Christmas to give the Ohio State Michigan game more breathing room if I'm reading this right. The <laughs> game, sorry, Jesus, the game gets to be fully sacred. We're not moving the football game because of Jesus. We're moving, we're telling him to move his birthday for the Michigan game. The game gets to be fully sacred and not impinged upon by someone trying to drag you to uh, shopping sometime in early December. You get your Christmas lights and decor up, but you aren't pressured because you have six to seven full weeks to enjoy them without it being weird. So anyway, this is like another six paragraphs of this from Jackson. <laughs> he has a point of view. It's like one of those things. When I just send a thing out to textures and say, hey, you got a rant. If you have 400 words on moving Christmas to January 25th in the holster, you've been thinking about this for a while. Yeah. Now, I do believe possibly we're not exactly sure. The birth of Christ was on de December 25th. There might be some new there's, ability there. Yes. Yeah, some, some, there is some reason to believe it was in January. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's other things. It's not just, uh, you know, about about having to put your tree up the day after the Michigan game. <laughs> what a pain. There are other things at play here. But actually, like, just pure logistics, 
I think Jackson might be onto something. Yeah, the logistics stuff are, are interesting because my my family, when we, like all of us were still living in Philadelphia, um, we would like all get together on Thanksgiving. We would all get together on Christmas Eve. We would all get together on Christmas Day. For some reason, we'd all get together in the week between Christmas Day and New Year's, and then again on New Year's. And we're like, it was too much. We don't yeah. need all that. So you can, if you can remove something from that equation and just push it back like a month, that'd be tremendous. Yeah. Uh, so good stuff. Brian, yeah. love it. This is Ryan. Actually, it's not Ryan. It's it's uh, someone that Ryan knows. Rant, why is it that I have to pay $70 per month for a live streaming service to only watch two to three college games per week? Yeah, There really should be a service that only has all of the networks that the games are on and costs $20 or something. This is especially infuriating during stretches where Ohio State plays several 65 to nothing games in a row. Maybe the podcast can start a pay-per-game broadcast service. Then I'd never need to pay for any other live service. Thanks, Ryan's Wallet. So Ryan's wallet uh, got on Ryan's text account somehow. Uh, we could start up that service before we were all thrown in jail after a week. Yeah, I do like the like a la carte pay pay for the game thing though. I think that'd be tremendous. Like you want to watch this game, it's three dollars. Like I would do that. Yeah, except they probably would make it. You want to watch this game, it's nine dollars, and then all of a sudden you'd be like, why can't I just get a pack? So they yeah. got us over a barrel, man. I'm not That's saying that, it's What's not a good rant. What's the what's the number? How high could they go before you're like, I'm not paying that to watch Ohio State play Michigan? What is an Ohio State game worth on TV? We should actually we can game that out. We can game out like we could set prices ourselves and then decide like is it would it be cheaper a la carte game by game? Would it be well that's a good offseason project? Uh this is from Todd in Phoenix. We will look back at the last three years and be disappointed and disgusted that there is nothing to show for it with all the talent that we have. Just the way we look back on 2015. Do you think fans will look back on this era? Not just that it's three straight Michigan losses, but that the level of talent that was present yeah. for three straight Michigan losses. Yeah, because the you follow Ohio State's social media accounts are going to keep throwing their NFL success in your face. Mm. You're going to see CJ Stroud and Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave and Marvin Harrison Jr. And someday maybe JT Tuimola Wow and Jack Sawyer and Denzel Burke and Jordan Hancock and think like, oh, that those guys are all there at the same time. They must have won a few trophies, right? And the answer is no. They didn't yeah. win any. They won uh I don't know that they won a trophy. They won a Rose Bowl trophy. Win the Illabuck? Did they even get yeah. to win the Illabuck? They win the, the turtle, they didn't get to play the turtle. Yeah. No, that uh that that I think is very, very much real and and is going to be a prevailing sentiment, yeah. Let's talk about offensive line. This is Steve. I know Ohio State lost a lot on the offensive line after last season, but it should have been expected. You reload constantly. That's the rule. Whether it's uh, Justin Fryer, Ryan Day, or both, um, we cannot have uneven play up front when the other offensive players are otherworldly. Calling the offensive line performance uneven might be overly charitable. Uh, Steve calls himself the dude, D-O-O-D, in Carmel, Illinois. Is there... Is there a different dude than the first dude? It is a dude. The other dude was the D-U-D-E dude. Oh, so wow. do you believe that there is like a rant that's just like the offensive line wasn't good enough and they should have known it? Is there a good rant? Yeah, that is a good rant because my every other position on the offense was held to basically the first round or bust standard, which I realize is like really hard to meet right? I'm, not, I'm not saying that they should have a bunch of first rounders on an offensive line but i don't i don't know why subpar recruiting was accepted on the offensive line for as long as it was um compared to what they were do, compared to what they were doing at quarterback and running back or excuse me quarterback and receiver and to some extent running back um it was just vastly different and and leaving a lot to be desired so um yeah they should have saw it coming all right this is a bunch of ryan day rants in a row that are kind of uh from various angles this is matt Rant, people calling for Day's job. He's not easily replaceable, and losing him would likely create myriad new issues that people aren't thinking about. We as fans need to settle down and direct our frustration in better ways. If we hired Jim Tressel today, people would be outraged over the lack of offensive production. Uh, let's do this one. This is good from Jordan. I rewatched the Ohio State Michigan game, trying to get as many views as I could to analyze the X's and O's. I'm a former D1 receiver, so I have a solid film eye, which we appreciate, Jordan. That's very cool. I came away disgusted that people are blaming Ryan Day for losing the game. He schemed guys open all game from the very first possession. A direct example is he got a Mecca Buka on a linebacker type player down the middle of a cover two look, probably a touchdown, and Kyle didn't even look his way. 
I'm not happy that Kyle McCord left, but we need a quarterback that can take advantage of what Ryan Day does best, which is get people open. What do you think of that viewpoint from Jordan Landis? I don't know. Um, Run it by me again. Ryan Day's scheme guys open. They were open all day, and if you're blaming Ryan Day for why the offense didn't play better, it's actually that they were open and Kyle didn't throw it to him. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Like, I talked about some of this on like the message board at Rivals. Like, it's really easy to screenshot open receivers and say the quarterback should have thrown the ball there without knowing like what his progressions are or how he's taught to read that defense. So, like, I, my, I personally hesitate to to do that sometimes. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Like, was 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 Kyle always missing guys and kind of screwing up Ryan Day's good design? No, I don't think so. But it probably happened more than it should. So, I I, I guess I would put more of the blame on Kyle McCord than Ryan Day. Um, but I don't think that that was like happening every single time that you could screenshot an open receiver um, without knowing exactly how Ryan Day was teaching him to to read it out. We also had rants complaining about like we need more aggressive play calling right from Ryan Day. That was a common theme. Uh, we had one that said the offense is broken, but this was a Ryan Day uh, text that I thought was interesting. This is Ryan. Um, let's see. I can't stand how negative people are sometimes, specifically in blaming Ryan Day. Day deserves criticism for several things, but I don't think he gets enough credit for how good the defense has gotten due to his hires. It wasn't long ago that we had awful defenses. I believe 18, 20, and 21 were some of the worst in school history, and Day went out there and hired a staff that has elevated the play at every level. This guy is two for three on defensive coordinator hires. I guess he's saying hit on Halfley, hit on Knowles, yeah. miss on Combs, which is huge when you're an offensive-minded coach. It sounds like some great CEO program building moves to me that don't really get attributed to him the way everything bad about the program does. This makes me think that he might have some pretty good instincts on who to hire to run the offense if he can make himself get a little less hands-on. I thought that was interesting, Landis. Yeah, I, I would say... I don't know. I feel like Ryan A's probably without going through each hire, I would say he's probably close to like 50, 50 on his hires. Like I think it's true that he's put together a pretty good defensive staff right now, but he also put together a pretty bad defensive staff before this one, I think. Um, and also like the imbalance of it too. It's like, it's staring him right in the face. That they need another defensive assistant and he's not doing anything about it. So I, it's probably, I think you're, I think you're right that we don't, fairly give him enough credit for like realizing that Kerry Combs wasn't the guy like being pretty aggressive about stripping the responsibility from Kerry Combs and then going out and getting a very clear upgrade over Kerry Combs. That, that was all good. That was good staff management, but it's still like, there's still enough lacking there for me to like, I don't know, not, not go fully down the road of, of the text here. Like I, I have some questions about Ryan day's ability to build, build a staff the right way. And Jim Knowles was number one on everybody's list and Ohio state just won the bidding war. So like, it's, yeah. I don't want to give no credit for making the obvious hire, right? But it wasn't like he plucked Jim Knowles out of nowhere, right? Like he was the yeah. number one candidate for a lot of schools that were looking for DCs that offseason. Yeah. And he's all like, if the defensive stuff is one thing, but if you look at the totality of the staff, it's like promoting Corey Dennis, the quarterback's coach, keeping Parker Fleming around as long as he has, not getting rid of Greg to draw with sooner. Like, I, I still think there's more negative there than positive. Again, worth a lengthy offseason discussion. This was uh, the last survey question I wanted to talk about. Um, how are you feeling about Ryan Day as the head coach of the Buckeyes after everything that's happened? I back him. He's the guy, but wow, this is a lot of changes with the portal guys and, and McCord leaving and all those things. So like back him, 47%. Strongly back him, 28%. I'm unsure. Three Michigan losses and losing the, losing the starting quarterback, that makes me wonder. 21%. Very worried, 4%. So overall, Strongly back or back, 75%. Unsure or worried, 25%. So again, that's still yeah. 75%. Like saying, like, no, I'm still with the guy. Um, not bad. Not bad. Again, not maybe what social media would tell you. All yeah. right, that's it for Ryan Day. We have to do, uh, we're trying to go fast here. This is Clark. Since um, Kyle left, after the bowl game, it will be time to bring in a new quarterbacks coach. The room needs to have a fresh look. So... Do you think that's true? This is saying they need someone different than Corey Dennis. Yeah. Well, I, I 
I guess if Ryan Day wants to continue the status quo of like trying to be everything all at once, then then maybe that's an argument against it. But I th- I think they need to progress beyond that and need to have a quarterbacks coach that allows Ryan Day to be more hands off in that room than, than I'm assuming he currently is. Um, so yeah, I th- I think so. I, I, it's just like a it's weird that Ohio State's quarterback position has become like a premier position in the sport. While the person coaching it, like in my opinion, just doesn't like carry a lot of cachet. Yeah, and and I clear I don't know. Prior to this year, maybe that hasn't been to Ohio State's detriment, but maybe maybe this is the first signs of it of it potentially becoming that way. And I would prefer to nip that in the bud before before it happens long term. It's one of those very difficult things where it's like again, he is not the most qualified quarterbacks coach they could get. That's just a fact. But then like, well, things kind of are working. It's like okay, well, I don't know. Like if people were like, why if it's not if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so for the first time, it's broke. Yeah. So now you would say, okay, well, then now fix it. Maybe you should have fixed it before. Maybe you never should have hired that person to be the, the fix-it guy. But if it was like, if the CJ Stroud was the result, it's like, okay, I mean, I don't, you know, what are we complaining about? But now this is a different situation. Yeah. Uh, I did ask that question. I forgot that one for the texters. Should Corey Dennis be Ohio State's quarterback's coach next season? 91% no, mm. 9% Yes, this is now to the last topic, and this is about the changing sport, how it makes you feel about your team. There's multiple things I want to run through here because this is feelings about changes. This is Mike. As an alumni born and raised in Ohio, the Ohio State is part of my identity. For me, winning every game is priority 1B, and 1A is having a team I am proud to root for. Similar to my children, I am their biggest fan, just as proud when they all fail if they give their all. College basketball was awesome in the 90s. It fell apart when the one-and-done transfer system killed the identity of a team because you barely got to know most of the players. College football was the last sport where you can hear about a young man in high school and follow him through three to five years of college. Nothing is better in sports than having a coach you trust leading a team of young men, improving every week, giving their heart and soul every Saturday on the field. Transfer portal, professional-minded players, and national recruiting threatens the identity of Ohio State football. I believe real fans can co- tolerate an occasional loss when we see a team of players we know improving and giving their all. I find I find that to be a very interesting viewpoint, Landis, and I think it's relatable of like, if I, if I feel like we're in this together and I know you, then we can lose together. If I feel like I don't know you, I have much less to relate to when it gets tough. This is another one about the future of the sport. This is Steve. I've been following Ohio State football since the Super Softs. That's 68, mm-hmm. baby. Long time. And I'm mad, sad, and frustrated over the direction of my favorite sport, the way college football is heading. I hate the portal, and while I think players should be compensated, the current NIL is terrible. The system needs regulation and uniformity. I guess the professionalization of college sports can't be stopped, but it is sad to my old eyes. Are teams going to have totally new rosters every year like the NBA? Stop the madness. Steve from Richmond, thanks as ever. Uh, This is another one along those lines. This is uh, our guy, uh, Dougie D. I'm pretty much out in general right now on college football. The last several years, something that I loved has turned into a complete dumpster fire, whether it be Ohio State's program or college football in general. So many of us, including myself, thought it was a great idea for kids to start getting paid for their name, image, and likeness. Of course, it was rolled out in the worst way imaginable with zero guardrails. And now loser programs are trying to find relevance by handing out bags of cash to impressionable young minds who believe anything they are told. Then there is a transfer portal, another good idea turned total joke by the current state of things. Experience any adversity or lack of attention and uh, you're out. Go better jump in the portal so you can feel a sense of importance again. Benefit some players, but the overwhelming majority uh, abuse it, and it's turned the sport into the Wild West. So Dougie D is mad about a lot of things, but again, it's it's like the way the sport has changed. A couple more, Landis. This is Greg. I've been a Buckeyes fan my whole life. I graduated from there. I worked there, but I'm close to being done with it. It's just Mm -hmm. now all about money and making the playoff. How different is this product from the NFL? At least that league has their act together. All the warm and fuzzies about good old state you are dead and buried. Now it's just rugged capitalism for all involved. That's where we are. Am I right or just a cranky jerk? Maybe both. Okay. There are clearly people who feel this way. What do you have for him, Landis? 
stuff changes, man. Like, I, I don't know. Like I, I get it. Like it's not, it's not 1968 anymore. This is a billion dollar industry and, and it has to change as such. Um, we want to go back to the warm and fuzzies of, of old state U. I guess we can do that, but then like, there's going to be one game on TV every week. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just not, it's just not the way of the world now. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be dismissive of, of the feelings there. Cause like, I, I get that it is a drastic change, especially for someone who's been watching, um, as long as, or as far back as the, as the super softs, like you've seen radical change in the sport over the last, um, five or six decades, but or seven decades, I guess. Um, but I, like I, it's cats out of the bag, man. You can't, can't, can't go back to where, to where it was. I, I, I think if there were better direction from the top, I think maybe we'd all feel cause like, cause I, I share some of the same frustrations, right? Like I think players should get paid. Um, I think there should be some freedom of movement for players. Coaches have it. Why can't players have it? But the fact that it is like a free for all and there's no governing body, like containing it or, or setting any kind of rules in place is incredibly frustrating. It's like both as a fan of college football and someone who has to, who covers it on a daily basis, it's just a lot to keep track of. And I do think it does suck the soul out of the sport a little bit, but I, I guess I would rather it be the way it is now than have players not get paid and not be able to move. Um, the way we've decided to do it is is certainly imperfect, but um, I'm I'm more glad that there was action taken to allow it than than I would be if we were just sort of status quo where we were 10, 15 years ago. I tried to analyze this in a way that I thought a lot of people could relate to, and I don't know if people saw it, but I did tweet a gif of Jim Carrey climbing out of a rhino's butt. Mm -hmm. And I think right now college football is climbing out of a rhino's butt. And eventually, you're going to get out. And while it's happening, it's gross. It's horrific. <clears throat> you can't get the image out of your mind. But we are in an era of disrupt disruption and transformation, and it can't stay this way. Like this, we are not at the end game. So I do think at the so my my only my main point is don't give up on the sport you love. Yeah, it's it's trying to work it out. Players need to be paid, but there is a way that if they get to a point where players are directly paid, you can have more of a contract structure. I think that will eliminate the the free for all of portal free agency because you can say we're paying you this. But by the way, you've got to stay at least you can sign a two year contract or a three year contract. You can't break that contract. If you do break that contract, now you have to sit out a year, but you're being compensated. So you're getting something. Right. I do think that will work. I think NIL inside the programs will be better than outside the programs. And I do think from Ohio State perspective, and I think this is what you wanted to get to. If we get to a world of direct compensation inside the athletic department right now, NIL benefits the schools whose boosters are willing to blow the most money. Yes. If we get to direct compensation, the teams that will be most benefited are the teams that have the most money, that make the most money. Ohio State makes more money than anybody but they don't have the boosters willing to spend the most money. And I'm not saying Ohio state fans should spend more. So this is a bad NIL situation for Ohio state. I think it could get to a point where their, their situation will be as good as anybody. I think the changes will benefit the sport, but also to what your point was an hour ago, benefit Ohio state in your mind. Yeah, I think so. That's, I mean, that's why you saw Gene Smith come out and in, in support of, of what Charlie Baker proposes. I think that's a step in that direction and that's kind of the idea that I, I think ohio state has come around to the idea that they, they're they just don't have the booster infrastructure to be um competitive i guess so like a texas a&m or a, like a miami just like yeah. people with a ton of money who are willing to blow it on teenagers who might play for their football team for a year like it is kind of an insane proposition if i'm a very wealthy person i would certainly understand not wanting to give my money away to something like that um because i don't think i would do it but people in Texas and Florida are willing to do it for whatever reason, and they're less willing to do it here um, in Ohio. But Ohio State is not short for funds. Um, yep. And that's the, that's the point we've tried to make with people. It's like people, you know, when this first started, it's like, well, why are you building a new tennis building? Why aren't you just giving that money to NIL? It's because they can't. But they very much want to be in a position where they can. And once that happens, I think Ohio State will be positioned as well as anybody. More pods, more shows on this down the line. Like this is this is potentially transformative for the sport. But again, don't don't give up on the thing you love because you are frustrated by it, because this is not how it's going to be permanently. And I do think it will get to a point where it is drastically different, but potentially just as good. And it's not going back to old state you, but I do think it will be a, pro a program that you can understand, relate to, 
root for and not have this chaos. I think the chaos is what's bothering people the most. And you yeah. don't understand what's allowed, what's not allowed. They're breaking the rules. Nobody cares. We're following the rules. It's hurting us, all that kind of thing. I think that will get better. All right, we're going long. We got stuff to do, but we got to do what you, and we'll do all that next on Kings of Columbus. All right, Landis, what you eating, brother? L lately, not a whole lot, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, last uh, last week, um, we got to have a uh, like a, a date night, I suppose, which we haven't never really had since the baby showed up. Um, we went to Columbus Brewing Company over here mm -hmm. on the east side of town, um, where where we live, and uh, some really good pizza there. It's like a it's like a square or, or more of like a rectangle, like almost like Sicilian slash Detroit oh. kind yeah. of pizza. Uh, really good. I would I would recommend it to anybody who's looking for a good pie in the Columbus area. CBC's pizza was pretty pretty solid. If you're gonna be square, you gotta be thick. Yes. In life and in pizza. That's right. Well, I'll, I'll go try it. That yeah, sounds like my cup of thing. It's like yeah. I'm anti-square pizza, but like if it's Sicilian, if it's Detroit style, then okay, then we're talking about a different deal. Yeah, there. that's right. So I'm going to talk about quiche because that's just kind of the guy I am. Okay. I think possibly I've talked about this quiche before, but I want to be relatable here. So I want to be clear. It's Costco quiche, mm. but it's the two pack of uh, La Terra Fina quiche. It's like, I don't know, 15 bucks. You get two gigantic quiches. You get like f four, five, six servings out of it. And uh, they're just, it's just a really good little breakfast treat. It's uh, spinach and artichoke or broccoli and cheddar. And then my, the key to it is I also uh, get a couple pieces of bacon and put it on top of the quiche. And frankly, oh, I love that. it might just actually be the bacon because it might, I'll put bacon on top of anything. And then the stuff underneath is like, who cares what's underneath? Bacon's on top. But <laughs> Bacon and this uh, this breakfast quiche, go look for it at Costco. Oh, yeah, I think you'd like it. I think I'm looking at them now. They're good. There's there's a lot of different flavors here. Yeah, yeah. This is great. But, but the two pack is it, the two pack you get. It's it's a good price for it too. Yeah, it's quiche that it's quiche for the masses. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I don't yeah. want that fancy highfalutin quiche. No, I want quiche for the people. That's right. There. All right, you, what you, you watching? Yeah. Uh, so last Thursday, the I was watching the Thursday night football game between the I think it was a. Cowboys and the Seahawks and when I when I've watched the games on Amazon Prime I've just like watched the regular broadcast but for the first time I watched like their enhanced like uh mm. like it's like next gen stats broadcast which is like shot from all 22 and then I don't know what they do but whatever their fancy computers are doing it like highlights players it tells you like this guy is most likely to blitz and like or and like it'll switch like rapidly and like most of the time it's right um so like that stuff's cool. I think it's a, it's a way for to make people smarter about football. But mostly, it's a broadcast from the all twenty two point of view, which is how all football broadcasts should be. Um, and I, I wish more of them were that way. And it was nice to have an option to watch a game from that vantage point. And I'll be doing it the rest of the year because I I didn't know that it existed prior to checking it out last week. If I could have a meeting with the Big Ten, I would have two ideas for the Big Ten. And frankly, we should be able to get a meeting with the Big Ten. Yeah. We're kings of Columbus, kings of the North. Well, who else are they meeting with? One would be. A collector set of all the equipment trucks. So you would be able now, starting next year, you get all 18 trucks with oh, the that's cool awesome. actual equipment truck design. I want that. I can just imagine kids, like like people will be decorating their basements with it. Kids would like it. It's like, we're as a group, like, again, if I had like a little investment money, I would just like buy the rights to the equipment truck stuff and do it. The other is an all 22 option for all big 10 games that you sell like, the, like the NFL used to have that. I don't even, I don't think it works anymore. What do they call it? Game pass or something. Game pass. Yeah. So like a version of that for big 10 games. So you could either do it. A, I think they should do it with all the big 10 network games. So then all of a sudden, if you're, if your game was on the big 10 network, it wouldn't be like, Ugh, it's on the big 10 network. It'd be like, Oh, it's on the big 10 network. I have an all 22 option or just do it after the fact where you can sell. Hey, you can get a, a $99 pass for the year to get access to all the big 10, all 22 film. There are a lot of educated, dedicated fans who want to peek at all 22. It's not just us, Landis. And I think that you're so excited by that. I think that Big Ten should seize that and, and make some money off of it. I'd buy it. I would I would buy it instantly. Yeah. I just think it, it, would, it would make us all a little bit smarter about the teams that we love and the teams that we cover. And it's not to say that we aren't smart about, about it now, but it's just it's it's an important vantage point that we don't all have access to that i that i just you know obviously it tells a much larger story of what's happening in a game 
I am watching, it's a new Netflix show called Unstable with Rob Lowe. And it's actually Rob Lowe's real life child is the co-star of the show. And it's only like an eight episode thing from Netflix. It just came out a month or two ago. They already picked it up for season two. And I just think there's a lot of sitcoms these days that the writing is dumb. And I think the writing on this is pretty sharp and clever. Oh, nice. So it's an easy breezy 24 minute watch, like short episodes. Um, but I thought it was entertaining. Like it, you know, the end result of the season was like, okay, that all like all made sense. But I thought it's just like it's pretty, pretty quippy and sharp and and smart, which uh again is not the case with every sitcom in the world. So unstable, I would direct people toward. It's like pure comedy, like straight, straight comedy, or yeah, I mean it's you know, there's um there's like a sad thing that happened off screen. Yeah. That's like the sort of the genesis of the show, but they don't spend a lot of time on that. It's mostly like uh goofy stuff. Nice. So good job. Check it out. Yeah. All right. What are you thinking? Uh, I just want to know whether or not I'm, I, I think I'm not alone in this, but my wife always criticizes me for it, criticizes me for it, for being really bad at being sick. Like when I'm, when I'm oh. sick, the world ends. I can't do anything. And like I was sick yesterday. I had, I think, I think both of us had food poisoning. She handled it much better than I did. I laid on my bed for the entirety of Tuesday <laughs> because I had food poisoning. But like when I get a cold, it's like the worst thing in the world that's ever happened to me. I act like I can't accomplish anything. And she always tells me that I'm bad at being sick. And I want to know if I'm being uh, dramatic or if everyone's that way. I wish there was a way to like definitively figure out people's individual pain tolerance that. Because the question to me is, do you actually feel more sick than your wife? Or does your wife feel equally sick and is significantly tougher than you? It's the latter. Yeah. <laughs> it's, def it's definitely that one. I'm, I'm, I'm comf or comfortable enough to admit that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just kind of like, take care of Billy. Billy yeah. Sicky. Yeah. Billy needs soupy. That's right. Please bring me a Gatorade. I'm going to sleep for the next four hours. And then when I'm done, I would like another Gatorade. So I do think it's one of those things. I've always, right, when people used to smoke, right, I guess some people still smoke. That's fine. But if, like, you go take a smoke break, right, it was, like, kind of a thing of, like, you can't smoke inside. You have to go take a smoke break. But it really is just, like, a regenerate, think, take a breath. And it's, like, I was, like, well, I want to go take a smoke break. I just don't want to smoke, yeah. right? So being sick is, like, a day-long smoke break <laughs> that it's sort of, like, like, I feel like, especially when you're busy or if you feel stressed, Right. It's the end of football season. There's a lot going on. Not that your wife doesn't feel busy and is stressed because just like you, she has a job and a baby. Yeah. But sometimes I think some people take being sick as like, this is like, my, I'm going to lean in because I need it because I have, otherwise I never have an excuse to not be busy and doing stuff all the time. Yeah. I don't just to have a, I don't get a full relaxation day. So I'm going to turn my sick day into a, regenerate and relax day and take advantage of a bad thing like do you does 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 little billy sometimes feel like you just need a day to yourself yeah even I think if you're so. in the bathroom 15 times well that's part of it too i, I wouldn't i don't know that i'd call it regen re rejuvenating <laughs> or relaxing but i do think had, had i not like slept and been in bed the majority of the day yesterday that i would still feel awful today and i don't yeah. I actually i actually feel pretty good so yeah it's hard. Um, I'm always torn by this because there does seem to be like a new thing in society, which is great of like, look out for yourself, right? Like make sure you aren't working yourself too hard. Have like, worry about your mental health. And then sometimes my instinct is like, well, if you worry about like, if you decide you don't want to work too hard, then I have to work too hard to make up for you not right. working too hard. So sorry. <laughs> and I have that instinct and I think it's because I'm old, but I try to be aware of it and not have it as much as I should. Yeah. All right, so this is a big thinking. I'm actually really wanting to help people here. I am big on do things gifts, like to buy people a gift at Christmas that is a ticket for something to go do an experience rather than have more crap in your house, Yeah, right? This is one of the great things that I've ever covered, and it is now in the Midwest. It is the U.S. Olympic Swimming Trials. They had been held in Omaha for the previous four Olympic cycles. They have moved to Indianapolis. They are going to be held in Lucas Oil Stadium. They are putting pools in Lucas Oil Stadium. Tickets are currently on sale. They will be held between June 15th and June 23rd. Again, the Olympic trials, right? They're just a couple months before the actual Olympics. The tickets, you can get a ticket for like 60 bucks 
for a day. You can buy an individual day. I think there's two sessions every day. And they say that the U.S. trials for swimming are like the Olympics because there are sports where the U.S. is so good at swimming. If you qualify for the Olympic team, you're practically guaranteed a medal because there's only two spots in every event. And there are times when the U.S. might have like five of the top eight people in an event. And only two of them get to the, go to the Olympics. And if you were actually filling up the pool at the Olympics with the eight best people in the world, seven of them would be Americans. Yeah. But you can only send two. It is absolutely crazy, intense competition. I covered it before I went to the Olympics in 2012. I went to Omaha. And it was in a much smaller natatorium there. So I'm curious how it'll feel in Lucas Oil. But the bottom line is there are a lot more tickets for it. And it is, it's a celebration of, of American excellence. And it is super high stakes. So if like if you think to yourself, like, I don't know, but like if you watch the Olympics and you have people in your family that watch the Olympics, if you go to the trials, that enhances them when you're going to be saying, hey, I saw that person qualify. Now I'm going to really root for them to win a gold medal. If you are at all into the Olympic movement, this is a rare new opportunity for people in the Midwest. The track trials are in Oregon. The gymnastic trials this year are in Minnesota. But especially if you're in Ohio, you can drive for the day. You mm -hmm. don't even have to get a hotel to Indianapolis in mid-June, and the tickets are available now. I hope there is at least one person watching this who buys swimming trial tickets for somebody for Christmas. It is one of the best things I ever covered. It is a tremendous High-level, high-intensity, super fun sporting event. And there's a lot of people who don't care about swimming but care about the Olympics. So go take part in this. Thank you, buddy. Just giving me a gift idea. It's super fun, man. If you're going to be around, it's a fun day. So that's all. All right. We got stuff we got to do. We got people who got to go places. I, I just am not good at short shows. Here's the rant. Could Doug do a less than a two-hour show? It's very hard. It's very, very hard. So I hope we got through a lot of rants. We still had many that I read that we couldn't include all of them. I tried to hit a cross-section of what Ohio State fans are feeling. We're so grateful that you guys are with us here every week. We will continue Kings of Columbus. We will continue Kings of the North as we get ready for the playoffs, as we get ready for Ohio State's bowl game against Missouri. We want to say thanks to our great producer, Mike Yurostowski, who makes us sound good and look good. He's Bill Landis. I'm Doug Maurice, and that was Kings of Columbus.